All right, welcome to B-Sides Las Vegas 2019. This talk is Applying Information Security Paradigms to Misinformation Campaigns by Pablo Brewer and Sarah Jane Turk. Uh, before we begin, we just have a few quick announcements. First off, we'd like to thank our sponsors, especially our Inner Circle sponsors, Critical Staff, and Bail Mail, as well as our special sponsors, Amazon, Blackberry, and Paranoids. It's support from these sponsors, as well as our other sponsors, donors, and volunteers that make this event possible. Now, this talk is being live streamed, so as a courtesy, pardon, as a courtesy to the speakers and to the audience, we ask that you right now make sure to check that your phone is on silent. If you have a question, uh, please use the audience mic so that the YouTube audience can hear you. When you have a question, just raise your hand, and I'll make sure to bring over the audience mic. And if you have any feedback about if you have any feedback about this talk or these speakers, there is a survey in the shed entry for this talk. That, we are the B-sides answers and we will not be silenced. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Pablo Brewer! Very home! Give it up for the Angry Hobbit dancers. Thank you very much. Ooh, that was exciting. Wow, well, be careful what you wish for. Okay, so welcome everybody to uh, Applying inf Information Security Paradigms to Misinformation Campaigns. Uh, today we're going to be talking about mapping misinformation attacks. Map uh, mapping misinformation attacks into existing InfoSec space. We're going to talk about why this is actually an InfoSec concern. And are my AV guys around that can deal with this feedback? Okay, we'll try it out. Okay, so uh, quick agenda. We'll do a little bit of an introduction. Uh, we'll talk about information warfare in nation states. Uh, misinformation and mass influence is something that, like a lot of attacks, started out in the nation state and military realm and has now been democratized and can be done by anyone. Let me shut off this mic and go to the other mic. actually have to talk into the mic. Can you hear me now? Good. Yeah, by, by sprint. Um, no, don't by sprint. Uh, so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, information warfare nation states, how this got started, and how it became kind of more commonplace and, and uh, why we're seeing it now. H how the influence actually happens. What are the mechanisms that allow for this? Uh, we'll talk about uh, some of the mitigations and challenges to existing mitigations. Uh, we have attempted mitigations, not very well. Uh, and then we're going to talk about designing shared responses and a different way to look at this problem. Uh, we'll introduce you to AMIT, our misinformation uh, security framework. Uh, and then we'll talk about how we built that and the way ahead. So uh, information warfare, nation states, information warfare has been around since the dawn of time. Ramsey's the second used information warfare uh, against the Hittites where he would paint these murals uh, about what was going to happen during the war. The problem was that there was no transmission distance. You had to go to where the message was and see it. Uh, but back as far as Sun Tzu and Clausewitz, Sun Tzu said uh, all warfare is based upon deception. Clausewitz said warfare is an act of force to compel the enemy to do our will. It's not to destroy things and hurt people. It's to change their minds. It's still influence. That's what really warfare is about. So, you know, why are we sitting here talking about it in an information security conference? You know, where's the, where's the cyber? Well, if you look at information warfare, uh, and it's a shame that they changed, the Department of Defense had this 
joint publication where they explained how the DOD did information warfare. And they had it very nicely broke out into these five pillars. Uh, so they had PSYOPs, computer network operations, or cyber, if you will, uh, military deception, electronic warfare, operational security. And really, when you talk to the, part of the expression, but the Muggles, and they say cyber, usually what they mean is some combination of two or more of these pillars. So they mean psychological operations combined with computer network operations, or electronic warfare combined with computer network operations, or some combination therein. <coughs> So when you, look at, uh, when you look at cyber warfare, right, or information warfare, or cyberspace operations and offensive, they're all based on influence, right? At the end of the day, you want the adversary or the target to make decisions based upon information that you're showing them, you're hiding from them, that you're changing for them. Uh, you want to deny or degrade their information stream so they make decisions that are advantageous to you. Uh, or you want to give yourself a leg up so that you enhance your decision-making process by giving yourself more information than you allow the adversary to have. Either way, if you're doing it on the internet, it's some form of influence. Very rarely is the end result that you're going for the effect on that box. It's usually on the air-breathing unit at the other end of that box. So let's talk a little bit about nation states. I'm not a political scientist, I'm a computer scientist. Are there any lawyers or political scientists in the room? Oh good, don't hate me. <laughs> this is like the fat crayon version, you know, Westphalian sovereignty is explained by computer scientists. <coughs> so most international law is still based upon the Westphalian model of the nation state and there are three basic precepts of it. The first one is that each nation has sovereignty over its own territory and domestic affairs. So I'm a country, I'm a nation state, my territory, the things that happen inside the territory, nobody should be messing with that. Those are mine. Uh, the second principle is that non-interference. Don't mess with my internal affairs, I won't mess with your internal affairs. And the third one is that each nation is equal under the law, regardless of size. Now, I wanna skip ahead a little bit, and I don't wanna go down a hole of whether or not the Russian influence attacks actually changed votes or changed the result of the election, but I think we can all agree that there was at least an attempt to influence those elections. I would say that those elections are internal affairs, therefore sovereign affairs, and had this been done by dropping leaflets into Times Square as opposed to memes on Facebook, we would be having an entirely different discussion we would absolutely not put up with that. So part of our question is, why do we put up with it on the internet? So nation states do try to influence each other. And if you work in government, you work in the military, they, they break it out, they call it the dime model. So these are kind of the big heavy levers that nation states can pull to influence other nations. So there's diplomatic, informational, military, and economic. And you go, well, that's great. I'm not government. I work for a corporation. Why do I care? Well, it turns out that you've got very similar levers if you're a corporation. So the diplomatic, you've got business deals and strategic partnerships. Your informational instrument is your PR and your advertising. We, most corporations don't have militaries. However, not all mergers and acquisitions are friendly, right? Uh, anybody <coughs> that's been... Uh, offered to be bought out by a large corporation like Facebook or Google and turned it down and then found out that they have a competing product that's almost just like yours, would think that that is not necessarily a friendly thing. Uh, and the last one is the economics. So your research and development, your capital investments are certainly a way that you can affect your business sector and your competitors. So these things do correctly apply. So let's talk, go back to the nation state thing for a minute. Um, most of us, anybody here not live in a democracy or something relatively close to a democracy? Oh, good, good. I'm glad we still kind of agree that in theory we're supposed to be there. So uh, Bruce Schneier actually wrote this great paper about a year ago, uh, and he talked about, well, you know, if you're gonna really attack a democracy or an autocracy, what do you do? And it turns out that a democracy requires that we have a common political knowledge. It requires that all of the members of that democracy agree on who the rulers are, that the rulers are there legitimately, they were legitimately elected, uh, and they understand how the government is supposed to work. Right? And those things are transparent. And the things that we disagree on are things like 
well, you know, how much government influence do we want in my retirement or my medical care or, uh, you know, the types of weapons that I buy? And those kind of disagreements, that contested political knowledge is how we as democracy solve problems. And we can do it that way because we all understand how the government works and how leaders were elected until you get to influence that deals with the elections. Now people start to question the legitimacy of our elected officials. So these are foundational attacks on the things that make our democracies work. So what's different? What, what, why now? If I just said that influence has been around since the dawn of man, what's changed? Well, let's go back, let's go forward from Ramsey's, uh, where I mentioned he did the, the mural with the hired lifts. Uh, let's go forward to uh, paper papyrus. You used to be able to, if you were the church or the state, uh, you would have these learned people that were literate, which was very uncommon at the time, uh, and you could get parchment or scrolls, which were hard to come by, and ink, which was hard to come by, and they could mass produce, mass in quotes, messages for you by hand copying these manuscripts and then giving them to messengers and having those messengers write out by horse or sail and transmit that message. And so transmission was limited, who could transmit the message was limited, and who could receive it was limited because you could only make so many copies, you could only travel so far. And when it got there, again, literacy wasn't very common. So you fast forward to the 1440s and you get the Gutenberg Press and movable type. And this allows for further mass reproduction. It takes a while to set up the press, but once you set it up, you can mass produce things quickly, but they still have to be carried. These presses are still expensive. Literacy is becoming a little bit more common, so more people can receive the message, but the number of people that can mass transmit is still very small. Mm -hmm. Move forward again to the telegraph, uh, and the telegraph is, requires infrastructure. So now what's needed is that you need to be within range of a telegraph station. You need to convince that telegraph station to transmit for you, which requires specialized knowledge of Morse code. And then this is key. Your recipient has to know to go get the message, right? Pony Express didn't, didn't exist, right? Brown didn't help you. They didn't come by with your telegram and just hand it to you at your door. You had to go to the telegraph station. But now you can transmit at near the speed of light over long distances. Uh, you go to radio. Uh, and the Marconi radio, and now the Marconi radio allows you to transmit at very long ranges, and it requires no specialized knowledge to receive the message. You just need a radio and to tune it into the frequency, and you can get it in your home. Now, something interesting happened about this time. Uh, let me go back a second to the Gutenberg Press. One of the things that you know the church and the state probably didn't account for is the fact that once the press is out there, Right? Yeah, it's expensive, but I'm guessing the Catholic Church didn't foresee Martin Luther printing his 95 Theses on a Gutenberg press and nailing them all to all the churches. Right? When Marconi invented the radio and people listened to the news on the radio, they probably didn't foresee that a lot of people would mistake the War of the Worlds for actual news and panic. So we fail to account for the fact that these mass transmission mediums can be misused, abused, or misinterpreted. Uh, so we move forward from the radio, you now go to television, and for the first time, you can now transmit not only spoken or written word, but you can actually transmit pictures and sounds. And really, up until the mid-90s, this was the predominant way to reach the public. Now, if you wanted to reach the American public, if you were an American living in the United States in the 1980s, you can't just walk down to your television station and go, well, you know, I'd like to do a news broadcast. It doesn't work that way. You better be somebody like the President of the United States that says, look, you're going to put me on at 7 o'clock because I'm doing a presidential address, or I'm going to pull your FCC license and transmit. And so, again, wide audiences, you can reach right to people's homes, requires no specialized knowledge. They don't need to know a priori that the message is coming, but you still have to be somebody of import to transmit. So what's different now? What's different now is that social media has democratized talking to the masses. You have to be no one of import to get out a message to a mass populace. And we live in a world where Katy Perry, God bless her, has roughly twice the number of followers as the President of the United States and 50 times the number of followers of the Prime Minister of Britain. And she doesn't have to answer to anybody before she reaches her 107, almost 108 million followers right now. And so that's what's different. We don't have authoritative sources anymore. 
and anybody can transmit to a mass populace and they can do it instantly. So what's really going on here is powers that used to belong to the nation state now belong to the individual. So the good news is the internet as conceived to give everybody a voice worked. The bad news is the internet as conceived gave everybody a voice. So now that we understand that we can all transmit, how, how does that actually work? How do those, these mechanisms of influence happen? Well, it turns out that if you're going to be on social media and you're going to transmit mass influence, you need certain resources. You need certain types of accounts. And this is not all inclusive. These are some basic types. So the first one that you've got is bots. Uh, bots are relatively stupid accounts. So they don't create content. What they do is they amplify content. They like, they retweet, uh, and they otherwise send out your content. Parody accounts are exactly that. They're parodies of real people and real organizations. They are not intended to be mis, uh, misrepresent the actual entity. They're not uh, intended to deceive you into thinking that they're at the actual entity, but it happens. Uh, the next one up is a spoof. These are intended to somewhat fool people that they are the legitimate account. I, I think it's funny that you know the president's Twitter account is the real Donald Trump. And it's the real Donald Trump because if you put in Donald Trump on Twitter, go have fun going through the account. There's some really entertaining ones there, right? Um, so those are intended to actually have you believe that they're the real person. Uh, camouflage accounts are used to infiltrate certain groups. So if there's a group whose narrative you want to change, uh, pick any group, uh, you know, the Scouts of America, uh, then you create an account and you camouflage as a member or an interested party so you can inv get invited to the chat groups inside of the news groups, uh, inside of the information exchanges so that you can take in the narrative and hopefully steer the narrative in some way. Deep cover accounts should never ever be discovered if they're done correctly. Those are very, very time intensive. They're very expensive. Uh, you can't just go out now and create a brand new persona on the internet because somebody's gonna go around and do a Google search and go, this person didn't exist six months ago, and they're telling me that they're a 35-year-old that's been working in government forever, right? It just smells fishy. So uh, these take a long time to create. Uh, they require substantial knowledge, substantial resources. Uh, but the most dangerous one is the takeover. The takeover is when the legitimate account of a legitimate person or organization is taken over. In 2013, the Associated Press Twitter account was hijacked. Uh, somebody tweeted out that there was a bombing at the White House and President Obama had been injured. Uh, and the Dow Jones fell so precipitously that it tripped the circuit breakers. They had to suspend trading. Um, and that was October of 2013. So those are the really dangerous ones. So now I've got these accounts. What do I do with them? Well, we say that there's five tactics. Uh, we call them the five Ds. Distort, dismiss, distract, divide, and dismay. So. I'll walk through these, I'll give you some very brief examples. Hopefully they're not, uh, not too abrasive or, or disturbing. So distort is when you take a fact and you distort the actual fact. No, 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 the Russians aren't invading the Ukraine. We're freeing and protecting ethnic Russians. Uh, dismiss, uh, you're presented with a fact you just outright dismiss it, don't, don't deal with it. China famously uses this all the time. They're routinely accused of stealing intellectual property by the United States uh, and industrial theft and espionage and their standard response is, not only do we not do that, but we, we are the poor victims of American aggression and hacking. You are the greatest offenders out there. Uh, distract is you don't deal with the narrative presented to you, you create a new narrative. So MH17 uh, was reportedly shot down by Russian missiles, the Russians said, they didn't even address it. What they said is, why, wow, I wonder why a commercial airliner was flying over a combat zone. Right. Uh, divide, you take the population, you divide them into two polarizing groups and you have them fighting with each other. If they're fighting with each other, they're not paying attention to what you're doing. And the last one is dismay. Those are ad hominem, hominem and personalized attacks. And those attacks are so personal that you can't even address them. In trying to address it and saying that the attackers were ridiculous, you lend the credence. So who remembers the Pizzagate scandal? Right? Yes, the upper elite of the government have a secret sex dungeon in the basement of a pizza parlor. It's like, I, I can't even address that. Right? Just by addressing it, I'm lending credence to the attack and the person making the attack. So, you know, what are our mitigations? Um, you know, the only defense against these kind of things is to really understand why they happen, how they happen, 
uh, and start kind of working your way down the line and seeing what things you can affect there to kind of break that kill chain or break that process. So the first way you've historically done this is uh, by using fact checkers. So either manual or uh, automatic fact checkers. So everybody here I'm, I'm assuming is familiar with either PolitiFact or Snopes, right? We've all probably used those. Those are manual. Um, the automated ones work in similar ways. They take a purported fact, they split it up into a triplet, into a triplet, excuse me. Uh, and then they use one of two models, either an open world model or a closed world model. And here's the difference. In an open world model, you can introduce new facts and they're assumed true, unless later you find out that they run a miss of another accepted fact. In a closed world model, you assume that all new purported facts are false until you can verify them with previously approved facts. Neither of those models is ideal, right? So in, in InfoSec, we would call these either whitelisting or blacklisting, uh, and they're not ideal. And they definitely don't deal with things like editorials and satire. And God knows we never find any of those things in the news when we turn on the TV or on Facebook or on Twitter or on any of the social media. So this totally works. Um, so moving on to social media, um, you can look at things like uh, propagation-based detection. So hop-based cascade and time-based cascade. Uh, so if you look at the, the graphs there, the top graph on the left there is fake news and the top right one is confirmed news. Anybody want to hazard a guess as to why the fake news has multiple peaks and the real news has only one peak? Lots of shares. Lots, Lots of shares by who? Uh, botnets. By botnets, right? So we talk about those bots that periodically reamplify messages, and so that's what ends up happening, right? Real news comes out, it comes out in the news cycle, it's accepted as fact, we see it, everybody understands it, and it goes out, we're on to the next news cycle. Uh, fake information is periodically reamplified because they want to keep it in the public consciousness. Now, because it's periodically reamplified, what ends up happening is every time it gets reamplified, it reaches broader and broader networks, and so what that does is that actually affects the cascading. So if you go to the bottom ones, the green, uh, line there is real news and the red line is false news. Okay, and so what ends up happening is you end up reaching a broader network with the fake news again because every time a new bot reamplifies, you reach new parts of social media, new accounts that hadn't seen it before. So it's fairly easy to tell these things. Uh, the last model there is the epidemic diffusion model. And that's that little flow chart there. Uh, that is a model that comes from tracking infectious diseases. And so RC is your rate of contact with false information. RF is the rate at which the subject is infected. And RC is the rate at which they're cured. Now, this is a nice, simple model. But the problem is that we really don't understand what's the catalyst that takes somebody from, OK, this time that I'm contacted with the false information, I'm actually going to believe it and become infected. We don't understand why that transition happens, why that phase shift happens. So, I think most people can understand the model, but it's arguable how useful it is. So when you take a look at these, they all kind of fall short. We now have more devices on the internet than we have people on the planet. The rate at which we create information is huge. Um, the Internet Minute uh, infographic gets worse and worse every year, uh, and really, you want to determine if something is false news, ideally, before everybody else sees it. But you're never going to be able to analyze the data and verify it as quickly as it's created. You're just not. So the speed analysis is a problem. The computational power that's required is a problem. You need a whole new internet plus some. Um, there's a lack of common framework, or at least there was. We'll get to that shortly. There's a lack of understanding of the emergence of characteristics. Now, what do I mean by that? Uh, we understand fairly well in certain circles that, hey, after your 15th or 16th tweet, uh, you're likely to believe something. Uh, what we don't understand is how much more do you believe it after your 16th tweet, your third YouTube video, and your fourth uh, Instagram uh, post. We don't understand that. Um, there's also a bit of cognitive friction and cognitive dissonance, and here's the difference. Misinformation works because you're already biased to believe it. Right? If, you if you fall for misinformation, you are probably already leaning that way. And so once you believe that, convincing somebody that what they believed is not correct is hard. That's that cognitive friction. And on top of that, there's that cognitive dissonance because 
they don't want to believe what you're now telling them is true. So it just doesn't sound true, it doesn't ring right. Those things are very hard to get over. So, so far we've been talking about social media and we've talked about leaflets. Anybody familiar with this copy of the Washington Post? So this was fascinating. Um, this was an actual printed newspaper. Uh, it was actually distributed at Union Station in Washington, D.C. this past December. Uh, you could find it at the newsstands at the coffee shops. It is not a real Washington Post. It was a piece of psychological propaganda. It's the first time since World War II that the U.S. populace has been the target of physical psychological operations products. It was put out by the Orange Group. They did leave little clues in it uh, that it was not the real Washington Post, but it was convincing enough that the actual Washington Post felt compelled to release a story put out via their official social media that this was not them, and they've since gone back and sued the group. So if people are falling for this, how's it gonna work when we get to deep face? Right? You, you talk to the average citizen and you show them a video and they're inclined to believe that video and you wanna tell them, here are all of the metadata reasons why I can tell that that video is faked. What they're gonna tell you is, I know what I saw, I know what I heard, and you're a government shill or you're a shill for whatever group uh, and you're trying to fool me. Uh, so this problem is really only gonna get worse. Okay, so data scientists and things. So I would love to say we have this one ring to rule them all, beautiful data science solution. The answer is actually no. This is a cross-platform, across the world, huge community problem. It's gonna take a big joined up response to solve it. I have a clicker, cool. So we're gonna need to build communities. And we spoke last year about the problems. This year we're gonna talk about the things we've done. First thing we've done is we've created, co-opted, adapted communities. Uh, we've got some MissInfoSec people in the room. David, you're one of them. Anyone else? Okay, I think we just got David lying around in here today. But um, we went out, we looked for people who were working on this boundary between misinformation and InfoSec people who were applying InfoSec principles to misinformation, people who were looking at it in, in, in that light, and we threw them all into a channel together and got them talking to each other. Um, I was one of the people who, at the founding of the Credibility Coalition, which is the standards body working on the standards for describing misinformation. We built a standards body within that for applying <coughs> InfoSec principles to misinformation. Um, the leads in that, just to give an idea of the, ver the variety in there, are an information operations person, a data scientist, an out of warfare specialist, and a social scientist. Um, we're, Pablo and I are both part of the People Centered Internet who are working on misinformation at the government level. Um, IRC, the, um, help me here. International Association. Thank you. Yeah, who, the ISAPs, um, bodies, who are response bodies for cybersecurity instance. But we're building communities on the left to deal with misinformation that include all of the people from the right, because these are all the people you need. Does it go any taller? <laughs> Sorry. So, and the reason we're doing this is because we need not just to admire the problem. There are lots of people looking at misinformation events, um, and again, one of the problems is the words, so we started talking about incidents, and going, oh, look, that's a nice incident, and not actually responding to it. So we need people to join up. Uh, one of the existing bodies is the, the ISACs, the Information Sh Intelligence Sharing Coordination Bodies, and the ISALs, which are the ones that the president ha doesn't have to sign off on. So we're talking about, um, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. I won't touch it again. Um, so we, we're talking about misinformation, ISALs, response bodies, but actually it's better to talk about cognitive security because instead of focusing on the problem, you want to focus on the thing that you want. You want to secure these groups of rights. Uh, you want to secure 
the, the endpoints, which is people, communities, the things that are being attacked. So, and, and you also want to feed back to things like uh, the financial, things like agriculture, all of the other communities that get affected by misinformation. Because it's not just misinformation for its own, its own sake, it, it hits everywhere. And the reason you want to do this, again, is not just admire the problem, you actually want to respond to it. You want to start talking about, okay, I've seen an incident, I've seen the units of this incident, I've seen the parts of this incident, how can we start responding, how can we start being resilient to this? This is starting to sound familiar? This is starting to sound like InfoSec. And we kind of thought so too. So, one thing we looked at um, was all the different views. So we found people who were looking at it as information security. So, so people like Dan Gordon, people like Gruck, um, people like Danny Rogers. And we found people who were looking at it as an influence operations problem. So people like Lynn, people, people like Pablo. Yeah, I know, you're top end of it. Uh, we thought we found people on both sides. Um, so, so Pete Singer and Grasimov in the US and, and Russian were seeing it as conflict. So they, most people talking about misinformation were really seeing it as a social or political problem. You hear people talk about this as a political problem. You hear people talk about it originally. We talked about it as a media problem. It was like people were talking about fake news as though it was just like a news pollution. Uh, but they're all talking about the same thing, just from different angles. And that leads to the second problem, which was there was no common language. So A, we've thrown all those people in the same place and got to talk to each other. And the second thing is, OK, let's start building a language. So we talk about incidents. We talk about campaigns as the, the longer scale, the one year, two year, things like the 2016 ele election, US election work it is a campaign. But within it, you get things like Pizzagate, which is a smaller scale incident. Um, within that, you see artifacts, which are the, the messages, the users in, inside that. And there's a lot of argument about uh, what misinformation actually is versus what disinformation actually is. And that's fine. We can have all those discussions, but we got to go do stuff. Uh, and we don't have time to argue about definitions right now. We've got to go respond and fix. So we've just put up a working definition, got on with it. And the things we need, we, we need this lingua franca, um, but we also need to start those defenses. We need to counter move. We need to counter move against, if you see a reuse technique. For example, we've seen this um, hack, grab a document, adapt the document, leak it, used a few times. Not very well in France, which is wonderful. Uh, we see people building tools, defense tools. We'd like to know if they actually work. So let's, let's start assessing those. Let's start worrying about the, the next thing. So far, a lot of the stuff we've seen has been pretty done. It, it's done, but it works. Uh, we haven't really seen much in the way of machine learning adaptation, this type of MLSEC attacks. That's gonna come. I, I'm expecting 2020 to be quite exciting. Um, <laughs> And very much on the narrative level. Uh, at the moment, people are still talking about messages, artifacts, misinformation at that level. What's really happening out there is narrative warfare. People are fighting in terms of the stories that people have as their groundings. They're fighting on that level. They're fighting with memes, they're fighting with stories. And unless we're working at that level, it, it's, we're, we're, we're losing. We're going to lose. Um, and the things that we need behind this are the, the, those languages, those common languages. If we're going to join up, if we're going to join communities, if we're going to have these joined up responses, we need to be able to talk to each other across all of those communities. And the first piece of infrastructure we need is frameworks, is uh, infrastructure. So the first piece we built was a framework structure. So meet out. Let's talk about this. So this is the pyramid. So I've already mentioned campaigns and incidents and narratives and artifacts. Let's, let's talk about what these things are. So this whole pyramid is what somebody designing misinformation campaign sees. They are building this longer scale thing. 
Um, they might be what Clint Watts calls an advanced persistent manipulator. So you've got an advanced persistent threat. They have a target, probably a target country, a thing they want to do. Uh, they might be a charm campaign like China. They might have a, a goal of weakening another country. Uh, they might have a secondary goal. They might have useful idiots on that secondary goal. For instance, if you are weakening a, a country through its vaccination scheme, uh, there's certainly plenty of useful idiots in there. So you have this longer scale campaign. You build these smaller scale instances within this campaign. And then you use the narratives of that population and you adapt those narratives. You target those narratives. You, you've just seen with shootings recently, um, there were original narratives and then suddenly there was counter narratives being pushed in, using the narratives of people and just adapting on top of those. And then you'll see the artifacts underneath that. You'll see individual messages, you'll see bots, but you'll see users, you'll see those useful idiots coming through. That's, as a designer, you'll see all of that. As a responder, you're going to start from the bottom. So InfoOps is going to come from the top. Data scientists come from the bottom. So you're going to see first the messages. You might see the bots. You might be lucky enough to see um, unusual activity. I mean, the days of seeing really dumb bots posting all the time, seeing these wonderfully fast rates, like screaming, hey, I'm a bot, look, look, are pretty much over. Now we're looking for the subtle things. Now we're looking for the subtle anomalies. But you're going to have to really fight from that artifact level up to the narrative level, up to the, OK, something's happening. And this is the same fight we have in MLSEC. Very similar toolings needed. So this, this, this is where we are. So you have attackers from the bottom down, from the top down, defenders from the bottom up. And the third set of people you don't see in here are the, the endpoints, the targets. Targets, the, the transmissions. So keep this in mind as we go through the next part. So it's a problem, but InfoSec has things we can use for this. We needed to build response and we build response fast. And we looked around and we found frameworks and we found sticks. So there's already a set of messaging formats that connect up those top level um, info ops, incidents level entities to those bottom level data science entities. So great, we can use this. And there are frameworks that already use this. So we found a bunch of stage based models. So we, we, we settled on the cyber kill chain, which already uses sticks. So cyber kill chain with the attack framework underneath it. In fact, we, we looked at a whole bunch of frameworks. We, we looked at really, really useful. They show you how people get radicalized. Um, we looked at some of the existing models starting to come out for misinformation. And we took apart a bunch of that attack framework. Attack Framework um, was useful because we have this idea of stages, but we also have this idea of techniques. For each stage, you can pull out individual techniques. So we were looking at, for instance, phishing. If you say phishing, you know what it is. You don't have to put in a long-winded explanation of this thing I've seen that involves email, that. You just say phishing, and that's shorthand. So it's shorthand for the thing, it's a shorthand for the response you've seen to the thing, it's a shorthand for who probably does it, and you can get on with actually responding to it. We want to do that with misinformation. So, next. So how do we, how do we build this thing? So we went and looked at existing campaigns, existing incidents, and we also looked at failed attempts. France has been wonderful because France is incredibly resistant to this, especially Russian attempts on France. They, they just kind of don't get it. Uh, there's a cultural problem there, which, great. Failures tell you stuff. Um, so we found about 60 something different instances. Our first problem was that there wasn't a master list of misinformation instances. And there certainly wasn't a master list of misinformation instances that was in a standardized form, so we built one. And we picked out 22 of these. Um, 
and we pulled out all of the techniques we could find in these. So, we've got a catalog. Here's one of them. Um, it's one of the really early ones. Uh, the first one that I saw was 2010. Some of the early Russian tests were 2010, but this is 2014. Just a really simple one day, a uh, bunch of people woke up in an area that had a bunch of chemical factories with a message on their phone saying there's been a fire, panic. Um, that was Columbian Chemicals. So this is, we, we built formats for how to describe things. Um, we built formats for techniques, so this is one of the techniques. So now we can talk about paid targeted ads. What is it? When was it used? Who uses it? Which instruments were you used in? So we know that it was used in Brexit. Uh, and this is, we, we have a um, GitHub repo with the latest version of the AMP framework in it. So this is just one of the technique sheets from the repo. So you link this together. And the way we, we pulled this together was we just did this top down, let's look at um, what we think the, the usual suspects are doing and this bottom up, um, what we've seen in terms of artifacts and techniques, build out this thing called Emmet. Uh, you're not supposed to read this thing. There's, there's a replay, go straight and see everything in gory detail. The top two lines are the big important ones. So the blue line is the stages. This, this is equivalent to the cyber kill chain. The next slide I'll, sh I'll show you has them in, in um, smaller detail. So these are 12 different stages that we think somebody creating a misinformation campaign will go through. The four above that is an aid memoir for ourselves. These are the four phases we think they belong to, and underneath that, the gray, gray lines are the techniques that we found in those 22 campaigns, plus a few that when we ran through example campaigns, we realized we'd missed. So, phases and tactics. Um, part of this is that most of the people looking at misinformation campaigns only look at right of boom. So left of boom, right of boom. So right of boom is after um, an attack is visible, widely visible. So in this case, after this has hit the general public, that's when most people have seen the artifacts and when most of the analysis has happened. That's not when you want to really hit stop these things. You actually want to stop this at the planning stage. It's the left of boom. So the left side, um, you've got planning a campaign, you've got some of the preparation work. So developing people, it's things like uh, find your useful idiots. It's things like set up your botnets. It's things like set up your backstories for, for your trolls. Uh, and then uh, micro-targeting, it's things like the ad network stuff. Most of this stuff leaves some form of trace. So how do we look for those traces? How do we stop at that level? Um, so we've got a bunch of work going on left of boom. And other pieces that get missed, things like measuring effectiveness. So if you run one incident, you're gonna run more incidents. So how do people do basic um, measures of effectiveness? How do they rerun? So this is phases tactics, and this is where to go find it. So misinfosec.org is where we're hiding out and there's an issues list, so if you see stuff you want to add in, and we've put a CC license on it, so you can just pull it and use it. And I think this is where I hand it back to you. Oh, okay. Okay, so now that we've told you that this is all horrifying and broken, and you want to run and hide, uh, we, we feel we should give you a little hope and go, okay, <coughs> where do we go forward from here? So we created this framework, um, it was a small coalition of the willing. We'd like to get more of you involved. Take a look at what we've built, add on to it, disagree with us, uh, help us to fix it. We want to grow that coalition. Uh, SJ and I are going to be leaving here at the end of this week, and we're going to be going up to DC to uh, help various entities stand up a cognitive security information sharing and analysis organization. Uh, as that gets announced, be on the lookout for it. Convince your companies, your businesses, your corporations to join and to share threat indicators so that we can get a handle on this uh, and contribute at misinfosec.org. Uh, we want to continue to build that alert infrastructure. Again, 
Uh, it's easy for us to take kind of a US-centric view. Not everybody here is from the US. Certainly Europe, Asia, Africa, the rest of the world needs this because we're not the only targets. It would great to be great to have an international consortium that could do this. Um, we're helping some Asian stuff. Okay, that. I know. <laughs> uh, we, we need to uh, refine the TTPs and framework. TTPs are techniques, tactics, and procedures. We looked at 22 uh, scenarios. Certainly, we don't know all of the campaigns that have happened. Uh, all of you have access to campaigns. I'm sure that we missed stuff. Uh, the really important work happens when you find not only the gaping holes, but when you get into these deeply held, irrational, religious arguments over whether this word means you know this thing or this other thing. Um, I'm a simple person. If it doesn't exist in the heat box of Crayola crayons, I, I don't recognize it as a color. Um, so we need some help there. Oh, well, we've got a response meeting coming up soon. When we're going to be talking about response at the technique level, the tactical level, and the procedure level. And then so for those of you that are already sharing threat indicators uh, using the MITRE's attack framework, uh, we are building schemas for take sticks and taxi so that uh, you can actually share those threat indicators amongst the various information sharing communities, intelligence sharing communities. Oh, and just the back end, because you know this is a data science track, there are some really good data scientists out there on that artifact level. You should track these guys because they know what they're doing. And I guess this is the, yeah, because there's always references. This is us. This is pretty cool. I think it's awesome to be able to plug into the Sticks Taxi framework and be able to maybe pull this stuff into um, you know tools like Anomaly. Uh, one of the questions that I have is, okay, awesome that we're we're doing this. Awesome that you know the things like the multi-state ISACs are going to have uh, eyes on this. But what can government actually do? You know, because we have a First Amendment, there's, you know, nobody trusts the government anyway if they say things are true or false. So, you know, if, if you're sitting in a government position trying to deal with, uh, with these threats, what do you actually do with the information? Yeah, yeah so that, that's an excellent question. The, the short version is what does government do to solve the problem? And, you know, again, speaking for myself, not for my employer, the government doesn't solve this problem, right? industry, in the community, in the citizenry solve this problem. What the government can do is foster those relationships and provide resources and ways for the communities to have those conversations and to be able to share that information and provide uh, intelligence and analysis to those things so that the people that can address these problems do address these problems. Some of these things are relatively easy to, to address. I'll, I'll just give you a very simple one, and it's not this is not a panacea. There are lots of problems with the solution, but one of the problems right now with the internet, uh, and this actually just happened a few weeks ago. And I'm sorry, that's not true. It, this happened in this past December. Somebody had taken an ultra right wing blog, had taken pictures that were legitimately taken by the Associated Press of the protests in Paris, uh, and specifically, they took a picture that was uh, published of a huge bonfire, and then they took a picture that was taken of a much smaller kind of trash can fire. Uh, and the narrative that this right-wing blog told was, this is the left-leaning news trying to make a mountain out of a molehill. These are both the same fire. And the Associated Press did it exactly right. Within a couple of hours on their official Twitter, they went back and they posted, I think it was about 19 tweets, with the pictures going, here are the original pictures. They are pictures. Here's the original stories that went to the pictures. Here's an analysis. We're going to circle differences to show you that these pictures were taken at different times and different places. Right? And the reason that the right wing blog was able to do that is when you look at media on a website, you don't know who, who actually published it. Right? You don't know what the original narrative. Wouldn't it be great if we could digitally sign our media with a serve so that I could right click on it and go, yes, this picture was taken by the Associated Press. And as part of that signature was the hash of the original URL. So I could go back and read the original story and go, OK, does the narrative that I'm being told now match with the original narrative? If yes, great. If not, 
this person signed it, right? The Associated Press signed it. The other one did not. Or maybe they did sign it. Maybe it was the Associated Press and Fox News to tell you a different narrative. I'm not going to tell you which one's true. What I'm going to tell you is now as a consumer can make an informed decision about who you want to believe. So we can enable those kind of things. Hopefully that answered the question. Any other questions? And so uh, the Chinese government, as an example, seems to be really good at dealing with uh, what they would consider disinformation and especially utilizing their citizenry to help. Do you have any thoughts as to whether examining the uh, Chinese modeling and uh, methodology would be useful in American space? Elves. Uh, <laughs> uh, all right, let me, let me, uh, I'll take a first swing at this. So it, it won't work, right? And, and it won't work because when you talk to the average Chinese citizen, they legitimately believe that the Chinese Communist Party, everything that they do is to protect them from bad outside influence. As Americans, we historically have a healthy distrust of our government, right? And so if the government tried to implement that, we, me included, would immediately shout censorship. Um, so there, there is some social background and there is some kind of cultural China part of the expression that goes along with that. You have to understand the ins and outs of the society that you're trying to either influence or protect. Solutions that work in China won't work here. Solutions that work in uh, France won't work here and vice versa. Uh, you really have to analyze. Now, if the same solutions were put out by freedom of the press as opposed to the US government, you might find that they have different perceptions. Right, that, that's what I mean. I was, I was, I was that um, exactly from the government, but a similar type of... Uh, yeah, this is my side of it. So I actually ran uh, an ELF, a prototype ELF campaign a couple of years back using Australians who had a hell of a sense of humor. So there is a place for citizen-led ELF campaigns, but you've got to work at keeping people safe. So there's infrastructure at least put in there. And we figured that this was the important piece of infrastructure to build first. And so there's a place. There's definitely a place for it. And, and there is some of that, right? PolitiFact does some of these things. It just needs to be bigger and broader and address more than just the latest presidential campaign, the latest uh, debate. Uh, let's go over here. Oh, I'm sorry. You've got the microphone. You pick them. <laughs> I, I just tried to see if I could make you do shuttle runs back and forth as uh, much as possible. Have you got a step counter on? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so it, it was mentioned that um, you know the real impact of this is in meat space and in the, the human mind. Do you have any recommendations on the hardening of that surface? Is there a way to hack my next door neighbor into being more of a skeptic and to critical thinking? Or is, uh, in a follow-up, I would, I would ask is, um, is American society in particular susceptible to these sorts of things, given um, certain large percentages of our population and things they believe? You Americans are so vulnerable. <laughs> <laughs> but there's, there was a lovely, lovely little leaflet put out recently about pineapple on pizza. Um, so one of the five Ds is divide. Um, that's his fault. He actually got five, that fifth D put on. And the if you look at pineapple pizza and misinformation, you'll find, uh, I think it's State Department put it out, which was just this beautiful little explain of how it works and just show your neighbors that, that'll help. I think if people know it's happening to them, it helps a little. So I, I actually do have a suggestion. Let me first start off by saying, we kicked your Brits out once, we'll do it again. <laughs> <laughs> Vulnerable indeed. Um, yeah, no, so you have to do things that are uncomfortable. So. Um, Anybody here not on social media? Okay, good. By show of hands, who intentionally follows people that absolutely infuriate them? Okay, that, that's less than half the room, for those of you that aren't in the room. You should absolutely follow people that infuriate you to see what the other side sees, right? So if you were an American in the 1980s and you went to the news, you had three options. You had ABC, CBS, and NBC. And so you and your neighbor could agree or disagree on how accurate the news was, but at least you saw the same coverage. If you watch the same story on Fox News and on CNN, they look entirely different. There is a vastly different reality. And so we're not even living in a consistent reality where we can have civil discourse. So 
you should definitely follow people that make you uncomfortable, see what they're saying, and, and try to at least understand, you don't have to agree with, but understand the argument so that you can have that civil discussion. Or you could do the extreme thing of spending six months driving around the country listening to people, but that's... <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we have time for probably two more questions. I've got five minutes left. This gentleman over here has had his hand up for a while. <laughs> You mentioned France as being particularly adept at combating these, or, or they're not susceptible to this. Do you know some of the reasons behind it? And it can't just be they're more skeptical. I, it must be more subtle, I imagine. Actually, their educational system is based on skepticism, so they are more skeptical. That does help. Uh, also, they were prepared for it. They watched America and the releases. Um, their system was set up so they have like a moratorium. Their election had also the hack and release. And they had everything set up. They just were, were ready for it. They had better techs. I think we have time for one more. Very interesting stuff. Um, I'm interested in the partnerships that you're having with the groups, whether it's your Facebook or your AP, uh, and I can see some possibility that there could be some progress made there where the AP uh, fake news comes out, they can address that. But how do you partner with or address the grassroots groups, your 8chan, your uh, subreddits that are created by or co-opted by uh, nefarious groups? Yeah, so um, let, me, let me go back a second to that, what I said before about that digital signature of where it comes from. Um, so a couple of things. If you were going to do that in the United States, first of all, it would have to be an open system. Anybody that wanted to apply for a certificate should be able to get one. So if you're a ultra right wing, you know, horrifying Nazi group and you want a certificate, I'm not going to tell you no, I'm going to give you one. But here's the difference. I said that before the internet you had authoritative sources. You couldn't be just anyone and transmit to mass media. Now anyone can transmit to mass media. So really the impetus is on the consumer to look at the source and go, am I gonna grant them authoritative status or not? And I'm not gonna tell you what that authoritative status is. That, that is an individual choice. If you wanna believe something that you see on the chan or on 4chan or on a you know, fascist group or on a white man. But those things trickle down into the... Sure, they trickle down. But again, it's one of those things where you go, okay, well, where did you hear that? Well, I read that from this blog. Okay, I'm, I'm not gonna grant that blog authoritative, you know, source uh, kind of status, and we'll go from there. We may have a small disagreement. We, we, we do sometimes disagree. Um, so <laughs> no, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I believe strongly that everyone has the right to a voice, but they don't have the right to a megaphone. Yeah. So that's where I sit on that discussion. So, yeah. I think we're out of time. Thanks so much for coming. We will be yeah. up <laughs>
targeted geologically, but it's really, I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's targeted by location. Uh, um, you might be able to actually measure sentiment in an area. Uh, yeah, it would yeah, we'll be actually the yeah. interesting. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Right. I got to go right Bar me. No, and so that's gonna... been one of the things that I've seen in all this. Yeah. And I've been wondering yeah. how evolution or how sort of weird. Like, some people don't do that. They We're thrive. still working that out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we need to talk about responses. We need to play some of the responses of the people. If we're starting to see the green rise the top, people sort of thrive in this environment. It's a good way to work Either protectors, like they see you, or bad guys. Testing, testing, hello, 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 hello. Ooh. So go to the office. <laughs> <center. laughs> yeah, that's that's where I would go. Yeah. Sorry. Um, Please. Why? Yeah, this is just for the Yeah, I think the truth is the marketing problem. I think the truth is the we can do some help with that. Uh, I'm trying to find out what the heck is video. So the video will be online on YouTube. So the deck is actually not on the other one. A lot of us are journalists. You can search for both of them. Nice. Yeah, that's very much my first talk. Thank you. So very important. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I, I get this, this input. The um, Fred Bennett Coalition is a whole bunch of journalists working this problem. I think you would enjoy being in there. Okay. Um, come join us. I will. Um, I work for a small company called Ascenta Global down okay. in San Diego. Do you want to It's mostly native. I was just, just out in San Diego three weeks ago. Oh, nice. I'm yeah. better than everyone yeah. else. Cool. Okay. Yeah, no, absolutely. Shoot me down where the slides are available. Yeah. Okay. I still need to do something about it. By the way, that's out. Thank you very much. Yes. Greatly appreciate yes. it. Seriously, pretty yes. much. No, I, I, it's all her fault. I, that's that's one of the main takeaways. Yeah, for many years, this is the, uh, really the most, probably the most important talk I've ever been last. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this is crazy. Thank you very much. We're not used to this. This is just not something that our Thank you.
If I come out of this, do do the levels come through? Are the levels coming through? Okay. So then, yeah, we are in Hey everyone. Hey man. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, a, a few quick housekeeping notes uh, before we begin. Uh, first, in the spirit of what stays in Vegas or what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, this talk reflects my own views and not those of my employer. Uh, we are going to move fast through a lot of material. Uh, please keep questions to the end. Um, and also, don't worry about trying to absorb everything on the slides. Instead, look at this talk as field notes for the deck, which you can come back to later, uh, or indeed now. Uh, the presentation with full speaker notes is pinned here on Twitter. Just a few more seconds. Your first week as head of incident response at Digicorp will draw to a satisfying and uneventful close. You walk past the last of the meeting rooms, along the corridor that takes you to the elevator, down to reception, and out to the weekend. That's when you hear it. The unmistakable ping. The email has the, C the, email has the CEO on CC. Thousands of dollars has been lost. Something about an application called Sunways. Code has been deleted. The suspicion? Sabotage. You're needed immediately on the 120th floor. As you press the button to call up the elevator, your brain starts to cycle through all the things your team will need to find out. But it's cold comfort that you've dealt with incidents like this before. Because the first thing you did when you got to Digicorp was ask everyone about the firm's most critical applications. And this is the first time that you've heard anyone talk about some way systems. Past experience is telling you you're going to need to pull together a picture with only a few pieces to go on. You know where the rest of them are likely to be, though, in all their fragmented, <laughs> partial, and inaccurate glory. And so it begins. The blur of phone calls, emails, and messages. Coffee, late meetings, more coffee, a tragic comic and constant struggle to keep everyone on the same page of what's going on, punctuated every now and then by a few slices of cold pizza. Eight days later, your team have solved the puzzle. You found all the pieces, and you've joined them up. The picture about what happened is clear. You've just come from briefing the board and as you think about the story that your presentation told in that hastily put together slide deck, 
Part of you is just glad that the last few days are over. Relief that you managed to join the dots, but another part of you is frustrated. You know that the mental model that the team's built up will soon fade from corporate memory, slower for some people, faster for others, until eventually it returns to the fragmented state you found it in a mere eight days ago. It's a privilege to be back at the uh, Ground Truth Track. No mask this time, a little bit of music. And a huge thank you to Gabe and Urban for once more curating an amazing space at B-Sides here uh, where we can share ideas at the intersection of data science and security. Make it stop. No, no. <laughs> so, uh, in the next 45 minutes, we are going to look at how knowledge graphs can help security teams address the problems that we've just touched on in our make-believe incident scenario, and also how we can flip the script on thinking in lists to reap the rewards of thinking and, indeed, operating in graphs. This talk is the product of nine months' uh, work in a live operational environment, testing a hypothesis that ran as follows. Um, to solve the problems we face, we need to be able to join all the component parts that relate to security across business and technical dimensions in a scalable knowledge graph so it's easy to capture, link, visualize, contextualize, share, interrogate, and update information in seconds for executive management and operations stakeholders. At its core, this hypothesis focuses on a user need which extends far beyond incident response and security operations because this problem doesn't just affect every function in a security team, it also affects colleagues in many other areas as per this quote from a CIO. Each quarter, my control functions bring me a report, probably a PDF, about what went wrong, but I need to run my business today using today's information. The data analytics struggle to produce meaningful, timely insights that can help understand security status, justify priorities, and track results is not disappearing anytime soon. However, even if we solve that problem, we've only won half the battle because as per this fantastic blog by Chris Swan, once we've mined valuable insights from that data, they then need a proper insertion point into the decision-making process. That means identifying stakeholders who should receive the information we have, identifying the right lens for presenting it across the various different levels of the business, adjusting that lens to provide the right amount of zoom based on the audience's context, concerns, priorities, and accountability, and last but not least, finding time for them to consume it. This is not a simple problem. Uh, it's also not a problem that's unique to the world of cybersecurity. Uh, as data engineers and data scientists know only too well, uh, this is a problem that appears regardless of the industry they work in. So in this talk, we are not just going to look at building knowledge graphs. Uh, we're also going to look at how we can create and deliver context-relevant and stakeholder-appropriate interactions uh, with the information uh, that the graphs link together, and of course, which needs updating continuously. Is our approach valid? Is our implementation practical? Can the concepts we're working with transfer to other organizations? Please share your opinions and questions with us during this talk <laughs> and on Twitter. For all things philosophical and technical, please at Dennis, um, who at some point might be in Portugal and might be online, I'm not quite sure. Um, he also wrote most of the code we're, we're open sourcing today. Uh, George Gigi has been operationalizing a lot of what we'll look at uh, and is the best person to go for a programmer's and detection engineer's perspective on day-to-day -day usage of the stack that we're going to look at. Uh, and for questions about knowledge graph ontology and user needs, you can point them at me. Uh, a note of reflection before a probably ill-advised live demo attempt. Uh, years ago, the paper, A Market for Silver Bullets, described a dynamic in which neither buyers nor sellers in cybersecurity had the information they needed to know what effective solutions looked like for their problems. I would argue this largely still holds true today. If recognizing that no one has the right answers is one necessary step to surviving in this industry, the other point the paper asks us to acknowledge is that any deviation from best practices will incur costs where individual members go it alone. Our team are big believers uh, in the value of open source and creative commons, uh, the continued perpetration of bad API outputs, two-dimensional dashboards, endless XML joins, and mirror mazes of macros and pivot tables makes it clear that we need to collaborate if we are ever to breach this current equilibrium and move from lists to graphs. Yes. As with anything that requires process change, the shift to thinking and operating graphs uh, in a hyperlink way does indeed have side effects in cost, time, and effort. Uh, I can also tell you from personal experience, it can be a massively frustrating journey to navigate. 
No, not everything you see here will be immediately transferable or indeed applicable at all to your business. Uh, but the goal today is not to suggest that this is how things should be done, just to share one possible path, the experiences we've had and the mistakes that we've made. So please treat this talk like a meal. Eat what you like, leave what you don't. Let us know what dishes confuse you and let us know what you would like to see added to the buffet. With that, may the odds be ever in our favor. Uh, let's cast our mind back to the imaginary incident we talked through earlier, the early blur of phone calls, emails, and messages, the problem of keeping everyone on the same page, and the dots we had to find and then join up. So here is a different version of how our story could have unfolded. Uh, let's imagine that when we joined Digicorp, it would actually been building a security knowledge graph for about nine months. And that, excuse me, uh, they'd also uh, grabbed some readily available data sets, stuff like HR data, uh, application user lists, alerts from some endpoint technology, uh, a few cloud systems, and of course, good old manual data entry. So, let's just check that we're still live and alive. <coughs> Okie doke. I feel very ill right now. <laughs> so, as we step into the elevator to the 120th floor, and we're going to be very glad there's so many floors in this building over the course of this demo, um, our first concern is we want to know who we're going to be talking to, uh, who's going to uh, be in the room when we step into it. We've got an email with the CEO on CC, and what that means is we don't want to walk in and not know all the names that we're going to be dealing with. So, we are going to do a search for uh, the SVP of Special Projects, uh, who was the gentleman who'd emailed us, there we are, who'd emailed us uh, about the incident. We're gonna do a Jira search. We don't have time to look for Pete Smith. There could be many of him. And what we've got back is a result. Great, Pete Smith is in our knowledge graph. This is good news. Uh, so what we're now gonna do, now that we know he exists, is we're gonna ask our knowledge graph to show us Pete. We've got his unique identifier in Jira, and what we've pulled down is the information that lives in Jira, the node, the edges around Pete, so that we can start exploring them in Slack, on our mobile phone, in a lift. So, uh, we've got some options here. Uh, let's get a quick screenshot of the Jira page, because we want to see what else that can tell us. And let's view some links, because that'll probably tell us some good stuff. So here we are, off we go. So first, we've just rendered a little graph here. This takes Pete, and it gives us all the links, the direct links that Pete has. And here we've got a screenshot. So let's look at the screenshot first. Uh, so this is uh, the data that we have in Jira. We can see that uh, Pete is uh, assigned the role of SVP Special Projects. He reports to the CEO. Interesting, good to know. This must be a fairly senior guy. Um, he owns a risk. That's interesting. We'll come back to that later if we have time. Uh, he manages a few people, and he's funded by the data science team. Okay, well, that's fairly helpful. Uh, let's skip out of that and go and take a look at the graph. Here's exactly the same data, visually represented, a little bit easier for us to consume. Okay, cool, we know what we're doing. And that risk looks interesting, because it says in the next 90 days, if vulnerabilities need mitigating or the app needs taken down, there's no single person who can make a priority call. Expected loss is one million if a similar incident occurs. Interesting, all right. So, we're now gonna look at the CEO. So we now know that the CEO has a data tag here GSP 353, and we can use that tag to go and see who reports to the CEO. So what's the reporting line that we can get if we go down a bit? So now we're going to get another graph. It's going to tell us some stuff. And here we are. So CEO is the manager of SBP Special Projects. Again, this looks like the reporting line. Obviously, it's a demo data. Usually, if you went down from the CEO, you get a much bigger hierarchy. It's just showing the content. So, we know Pete's a senior person. He's got an engineering team underneath him. Uh, the question is, though, who are these people who have these roles? Who's the lead engineer? Who's the platform specialist? Who's the engineer? Uh, we know from our training in the knowledge graph 
uh, that when we have nodes like this, we can ask who is that role assigned to using a search called role is assigned to, and we're going to hit that. So we're going to try and use some natural language now to explore the graph so that when we teach people this um, at work, they, they know where they're going and it's fairly easy for them to do. Uh, and we get an expanded graph. Right, this is fairly handy. This is what we were after when we started our search. We want to know who's going to be talked about in this room, who are the people we're going to be meeting with. And right here, uh, we can now see that our CEO, who we haven't met yet because it's our first week, is Alan Lee. Uh, we know that uh, Pete Smith is the guy who wrote the email, Bruno Lyon, uh, Norman Ligos, Sophia Berlin, and Alan Champion. Great. Okay, so we've now got our org structure. So, uh, we know that we are dealing with an incident about an application called Sumways. We have absolutely no idea what Sumways is. Uh, so the next search that we're going to do as we continue going up the elevator is for Sumways. So let's see what Jira tells us about this. Hmm, this does not look good. It looks like Sumways has had some pretty serious incidents associated with this before. For example, uh, we've got admin accounts here shared across users. Uh, we've got uh, questions about detections for malware and hacking. And if we expand that out, we can see there's really an awful lot of stuff that looks like we should know before we walk into that room. Uh, let's take a look at one of them. So we're now going to dive from here into one, one, two, nine, six. Come on, brain. There we are. So, with any luck, ah, right. So sorry, that's done a pop up on my sec one two two nine six on my current screen, which is not helpful. So rather than uh, uh, put that in there. Okay, cool. So we have now dived into Jira. We've gone from Slack because we want to explore the graph through Jira. And what we're seeing is a question that was clearly asked during this previous incident. And we've got a ton of stuff here where it seems that it's been established that there have been an awful lot of detections from the EDR software um, against certain users. So obviously, we are interested in taking a bit more of that. So something jumps out at us, he says. <laughs> or it did at least when I was preparing the demo. Ah, there we are, uh, brute forcing. So obviously we're gonna be interested in detections of brute forcing. Okay, great, we've got a detection here, and here we've got a computer. We've got a device that it's linked to. It's pretty cool. Uh, we wanna see who owns the device. Let's take a look. Uh, we skip into that, and Jira is telling us this is owned by Alan Champion. Okay, interesting. We saw Alan at the bottom of the chain. He's the one who had this weird detection for something that, that we were interested in. We're now gonna jump in to Alan, and what we're gonna see here Ah, he is the admin for Digi Inc. Hmm, okay. So, if we jump in to this, we can now see that at some point that had a login detection against it from a non DigiCorp IP. Uh, bad news, it doesn't seem like there's any option to enforce or enroll 2FA. That seems fairly serious. Um, and we can also see who else shares that admin credential. So, what we're going to do now is go back to Slack, and we're going to dive in to the data update about some ways. So we've gone a little exploration through JIRA, but JIRA wasn't working for us. We got caught up in this kind of minefield of information. We want an easier way to consume that. So here, uh, once more, we have our handy view in Slack. And what we are going to ask is, what are the linked issues? So as we go down, we can see loads of incident facts. So at some point, the team that have dealt with this incident have gathered a ton of data as they've been going through it. This all looks very helpful. We can see the admin account. Uh, we can see the user account. Uh, if we want, we could edit some fields, we could change the assignee, we could add a description, we could add some labels, we could change the workflow, and so on. Uh, and if we dive into this, let's have a look at what the first fact tells us in our graph. Lambda functions are working away. Hopefully. Ooh. 
Ah, there we are. It's there already. Uh, so, no single accountable lead for technical support and triage in the team uh, in the event of an incident. Uh, that doesn't sound great. Uh, we can see there's a vulnerability there. Let's take a look at that, uh, see what that vulnerability is. Okay, so in the event of another incident or a requirement for architectural change, there's no person who can make a final decision on the impact or appropriateness of a change. Uh, that doesn't sound too great. Uh, let's go in to JIRA and take a little look at that. Must have deleted that one. All right. Um, so, long story short, what we're beginning to run into is that we're having to jump back and forward between Slack and Jira to try and answer the information we want. And that's pretty cool in some circumstances, in some areas or some instances where we're going to want to do that. But really, uh, what we're after is an easier way to consume that information. So, let me see if. Right. So this is, if this works, this is going to be a transcontinental live demo. <laughs> George is currently either not watching this like he said he would be and <laughs> telling fibs, or uh, he's going to come online, um, which I might need him to, to do the Jupiter support bit. George, if you're out there, George, I need your help now. <laughs> don't, don't leave me, man. All right, I'm going to assume that there's a long lag on the online support. I, I'm, going to, I'm going to forgive you. Oh, my man. <laughs> ah. So, awesome stuff. So, George, are you able to do the JP servers command here? Because I'm now out of the lift, I've got to run down another really long. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to run down a really long hallway, and I just don't have time to call down this JP server. So, um, can you give me uh, some form of signal if that's okay, or I'm going to try and do it from the um, commands I've got here. Let me. Ah, oh. <laughs> now this is how live demos should be done. I don't know why I haven't done this before. Right, quickly, before we... very busy, very busy. Okay, so what George is going to do, hopefully, um, is he's going to now call um, a, a, a Jupyter notebook, uh, which basically has a, a prepackaged way for us to view all the things that we're interested in uh, in this demo. Uh, and once that comes up, uh, fingers crossed, uh, once he starts doing it, um, we're going to see um, some more stuff. Uh, so while he's doing that, I'm going to show one other thing. Uh, so one of the things I mentioned was um, very often getting hold of information in kind of a consumable format. Uh, that stakeholder ready is difficult. And we've seen a number of components in this knowledge graph today. We've seen risks. We've seen vulnerabilities that trigger those risks. We've seen people who own those risks. Um, and we've seen um, a ton of facts, a ton of kind of um, ground truth data that's been collected and evidence has been gathered during our day-to-day our -day work. So one of the things um, that Dennis um, did when he built this is a lot of the pain of our lives in security is putting together slide decks. Um, and what we've done is create auto templates so that all that data that lives in the graph, once you begin structuring it in the way that we'll discuss in the ontology section of this talk, you can begin automating the generation of PowerPoints. Not only that, but you can begin sending them through Slack or Mattermost or whatever information messaging service you have to the right stakeholders. And you can put in um, interactive buttons for people to go, I accept that risk, or I want a meeting, or I don't have time to read this slide deck right now. Can you give a briefing to one of my team? 
And in doing that, you can solve a huge amount of the pain that it, kind of we have to do to begin to extract information. So this is just an example that Dennis put together um, of what one of these slide decks looks like. Um, I'm going to ping back George back in a sec just to see if he can finish off the demo. So what we've got here, essentially, what's happening in the background to this is an instance of Chrome is being spun up by a Lambda function. We're logging in non-interactively to Chrome. We're opening this page in Jira. We're taking a screenshot of it. We're sending it back to the place it's stored. We're putting it into a slide deck. And that all happens in a matter of seconds. So this is like programmatic creation of stuff from applications, which is super cool. Um, Dennis has also done a huge amount of work to clean up the format of Jira. So it's super messy uh, when you actually first start doing this. Um, but with a few uh, tweaks, um, you can actually begin to create really nice consumable information out of the way that, that Jira presents things. You can generate timelines. So great thing about Jira, everything has a timestamp. If I want to say this happened, this happened, this happened, all I need to know is like how I want to create that path in the knowledge graph, um, and I can go create it. Um, if we want to pull down graphs, we can do that. If I wanted to, I could instead ask to just show a part of that graph and to break the text out of the graph and put it in a table, for example. If I wanted to show all the detections that we have against our EDR software, I could create a heat map of that. Um, so we saw earlier that we map roles and teams. So I could create that for each team I have, and I could send a heat map of the detections that the various teams have had via Slack to the various team owners uh, in our business to say, this is what your lay of the land looks like this week. That dude who's had like 20 detections for adware, that's all software that he needs to do his job. You should probably buy him a good license version rather than the crappy one that he's downloaded, which comes packaged with a load of adware and McAfee. Um, <laughs> So uh, this is like you know just another example. Like if I if I want to if I know I want to understand accounts that have access to things in the application scenario. Again, once I have those paths in the graph, all I have to do is create a reusable, almost like microservice lambda function uh, to pull that data out of my graph, dump it into the format I want. You can do a ton of stuff with this. Um, Dennis, to his credit, is on holiday and has basically worked 18 hours a day to make this demo happen. Um, so as as is George um, and I won't. Uh, Ah, it's your server. Great, we're back. Cool. So fingers crossed, I can click on this, uh, and this is going to load up. Yeah, that's, that's it. Let me just try and get my mouse back to base. Let's create another desktop, drag and drop this in. Uh, da -da -da -da. Expand that out there. Da -da 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 -da. Here we are. OK, here we are. So here's the big size presentation. Thank you, George. Legend, your own time, what a time to be alive, as he likes to say. Uh, so that's the slide generation uh, thing. Uh, but the thing that George has done uh, when he was running this incident um, is uh, create a prepackaged recipe book in Jupyter. So one of the things that pains me in our industry is very often we end up asking the same questions multiple times. And very often, um, I end up asking questions that many others in our industry have asked before me, because uh, certainly the issues that we generally face aren't new, right? especially if we work in incident response. Wouldn't it be great if there was a way to codify that knowledge in a way that everyone in our industry could access open source? And this is kind of how we're beginning to do it. Um, so what you have here uh, is a recipe book that gives me, as the head of incident response, the lenses that I want into the data when I have any incident. And in order to create this, uh, all I have to do is drop in the title of the incident. So once I create an incident in Jira, or once I create an application, this recipe book works for anything, because it's agnostic of the particular data. It just asks questions through a path in a graph. Um, so we can now create this scalable thing that says, right, OK, well, here are all, here's the playbook, basically. These were the questions that this person who managed that incident had in their brain that they knew to ask in this sequence. Like, here was the way that they went from A to B to C in that incident. Um, we haven't got the timeline for some reason. That was working this morning, for which I apologize. Um, but hey, like, at least the demo has worked up till now. We're almost at the end. We breathe a sigh of relief. Um, so this, we're just running through here. So you can see here what we've got. Like we've got an incident view. We've got graphs that help us understand the application. Oops, subways, <laughs> still there. Um, sorry, it's some ways. Um, this is not an incident about subways. Uh, control <laughs> capability failures. Oh, cool, here we are. So the other cool thing about this um, is that um, we can bulk edit data right now from Jupyter into so we don't have to create things individually. If I'm in a meeting, if I'm in a war room meeting with an incident, I can literally be adding questions, adding decisions, adding people to my knowledge graph in real time 
through this interface. This is like the control panel um, to begin graphing stuff. And once you kind of get this, you power, you end up graphing everything. You can get a little bit, we, we did get a little bit too much into it, which I think we've pulled ourselves back from the brink. Um, but here you can see like these queries here, these are the queries that are generating this graph. And as long as my graph has standardized queries, again, I can replicate this for loads of other stuff. And if I wanted to, I'm not brave enough to because I'm not technical enough to, I could change this now, add something else in, and it would change the graph live. So if I know what questions I want to ask of the graph, I can use this recipe book to begin building my own whole new dish based on the scenario I have. So this is the building block for me to expand stuff out. Uh, so understanding Subway's accounts, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you can graph things like this. Like we use plant UML just because it's super easy to read. But if you want to do more kind of Neo4j-esque stuff, you can do it like this. So this is showing the middle is Subway's application, the accounts around the edges, uh, sorry, the accounts the next layer in. And then we can see all the, um, uh, the alerts and the people who own those accounts that are associated with them. Um, and also, I know we've talked a lot about incident data, but when we run incidents, one of the things that we do is we look at what the facts that we discover during that incident tell us about successes and failures of our security controls. So in PIR, what this enables me to do after an incident is go through here and say, right, well, for example, this fact that there's no authentication gateway uh, for an application indicates a failure of identity and access management, secure architecture, secure engineering, and I can actually begin to build out a picture of how successful my controls are for certain coverage across certain elements that I'm interested in in my environment, and I can begin to look at that across my entire enterprise. All I need to do is start linking the data together. Um, so uh, that concludes the demo. Let's just go... Cool. Thanks, George. Thank you. Thank you. The goat sacrifice was not in vain, people. <laughs> it was not in vain. Turns out you can have anything delivered to your door in Vegas. Is it about to go horribly wrong now, though? <laughs> this, would be, this would be typical. No. Ah, we're back. Right, cool. Okay. <laughs> so... Let me navigate back to the slide where, and let's have a look. So, how am I doing for time, please? Twenty, twenty-five. <laughs> As in left. <laughs> Ready yourselves, people. This is not going to it's not going to be easy. So. Let's have a look at the tech stack. Uh, there were quite a few moving parts there. Uh, before we go behind the scenes. help us move faster in partnership uh, that is not to say the primary function of our tech stack is not to automate pain away it is to enable us to deal with that pain faster it should basically be like an Iron Man suit which any member of the team can put on to help manage new problems quickly and efficiently and once knowledge and analytics are based uh, baked together sorry into a process that is stable and reusable only then will we add automation uh, this approach draws inspiration from this article which is super cool called automation should be like Iron Man not Ultron and basically the goal is to enable us to do the creative stuff enhance our data system and keep ourselves moving moving faster rather than doing boring repeatable tasks Second, we want to make it easy for anyone who joins our team and eventually the wider business to be able to find and understand patterns in data, both at systemic and local level. So rather than providing set ways of looking at something, we want people to be able to benefit from our knowledge base, but also add their thinking and, right, and evolve it and take it to the next level. To do that, we basically want to take a list of questions like this, and we want to build them into something like this. So these are lists of ingredients in data, examples of recipes, and eventually a library of microservice runbooks, which can be taken and joined up as similar patterns emerge to the ones that have uh, happened uh, to create them. So this slide provides a rather abstract visualization of this process, but basically from the top, to deliver a specific mission, for example, an incident response, you know, as you're in diagnosis mode versus solving versus mop up and PIR, you're going to use different data building blocks. These are your ingredients. Those ingredients are going to be combined in different recipes over that life cycle to uncover knowledge, answer questions, complete tasks, etc., etc. And in future, what we hope is those recipes become reusable. Uh, finally, there's a heavy focus in our system uh, on um, the ETL phase of transformation. Why? 
Curveballs in consuming data are sadly the rule, not the exception. Uh, messiness is a feature, not a bug, especially it seems when you need to consume and correlate data at short notice. Uh, so we designed heavily for that. So let's take a tour through the data system. Here are its current components, the lines between them indicating a route of input or output for data to flow. At this point, well, probably before this point, you may have been thinking, Jira? <laughs> More on that in a moment, but when we began building this, we had a shoestring budget. We needed a system that we could choose to scale as we wanted it to scale. And sure, it may look a little bit weird at first glance, but sometimes you have to sail with the ship you have rather than the one you want. If I'm honest, of all the data systems I've seen built and worked with to try and solve analytics problems in security, this is by far the most elegant. So a few definitions in terms of how we think about the data system components. JIRA is shorthand for our graph data store and ontology management system. As well as having a lot of highly configurable fields, it also logs every single change that's made under a ticket, providing a full audit trail of who did what, uh, updates to what ticket and when, and who doesn't love a good audit trail. ELK is our friendly, friendly neighborhood index where we store JIRA data so it's easy to search and visualize of our Slack. It's also a good place for us to analyze and visualize trends relating to nodes and edges, albeit more in terms of how people are using the data system rather than actual operational scenarios. Slack. Slack is basically our command line tool as well as the communications fabric that our company runs on. This lets us automate all kinds of feedback loops uh, via a medium that our colleagues are already familiar with and are engaged with a huge amount of the time. A big shout out here to Ryan Huber, whose blog on distributed alerting informed a lot of our thinking, um, and all we've done is really add a sprinkling of JIRA into the mix. Uh, here's a few examples of the kind of command lines we can call down through Slack. Uh, here's another one. And then finally, Jupyter. So this is our more advanced interface for creating and working with both ingredients books and recipes. Here's an example of an ingredients book. And basically what this is designed to do is enable easy exploration of relationships between all our asset vulnerability and risk data. Um, so when I think about all this, when I think about this tech stack, um, these are effectively like a choice of interfaces, either for users like me who are non-technical um, or those like my colleague George who are highly technical. So we can pick and choose how we want to interact with our graph. Uh, then in the middle, we have GSBot acting as the API broker to make all these various connections possible. That's the tech, but what about the problem set that this actually solves for real people? Uh, here's the frame of reference that we use for thinking about the modes and triggers people have when they need to interact uh, with data information. And a huge thanks to Russ Thomas, Mr. Meritology, for sharing the triggers part of this with me year, years ago uh, as it inspired my thinking. Uh, we can map our modes to different parts of the data system where they fit best and consider what interface is best under what triggering condition. And this helps us consider routes for inputs into our knowledge graph and indeed those outputs that support feedback loops. So with our robot army of Lambda functions acting as the glue box between this system, we can now do things like this. So when we were graphing manually on the fly, or sorry, uh, as you'll see in a moment, um, effectively we're under a kind of crisis trigger under interrogate mode. Um, and this is basically what's happening in the background, right? Um, tickets are created from Slack, tickets sync to Jira, Jira sync to Elk, and then as we query it goes back to Slack, all happens in a number of seconds. Uh, Dennis is, if nothing else, super focused on speed uh, of execution um, in this kind of stack, and it's very, very impressive to see how quickly uh, it responds to commands. Uh, for batch graphing, uh, we can basically dump stuff, as, as we kind of touched on in the demo, uh, through slides into Jupyter, sync them to Jupyter, index in Elk again, search in Slack, explore stuff, you know, that's, that's kind of the workflow uh, for that. Uh, here's an example of a Jupyter recipe book. Uh, ooh. Yeah, so a video. Um, so I'm not going to go through this. Uh, we'll make the video available online. All this is saying is like ultimately, once you've taken two or three messy data sources and you've done the, the the stuff once the parsing, like why not batch that, right? Let me take that data and start to identify weird things about it, right? So um, this is a representation of an ontology, but it's amazing how much business context you can get from just two or three data sets, like your HR database, some random application access lists, right? And anything else you can get your hands on. Uh, the gray boxes represent data which is going to need to come from elsewhere, um, but even even with a few data sets, you can start building out context between business and technology dimensions, which after all is exactly why we set out on this journey. And it's a short jump to getting data like this to using the passing process to identify inaccurate, incomplete, and incongruous data. For example, who owns that active generic account in that SaaS system which has a .com email domain which isn't yours and seems to have last logged in three years ago? And why is there a disagreement between System X and your HR database about whether or not this employee it still works for you? These are the kind of questions that leap to the fore when you start taking these very basic data sets and asking simple questions of them. Um, 
So those sound like facts we might want to capture, present to management, and um, present potentially a vulnerability. And now we have the beginnings of building out our graph from just a few data sets that we already have to begin starting to operate in graphs. It really doesn't take much, super cool, and we're more than happy to talk to anyone about how uh, you can speed up that journey if you're interested in going on it. Uh, here's just an example of a recipe book we have. Like effectively, what we've done here uh, is mapped an application uh, via reporting line up to the CEO just so we can better understand the stakeholder landscape. So I showed you that example earlier of mapping down from the CEO. This is a real example that we use in our company. Um, and here's another example with a slightly different lens where we actually want the names of the people. And this, maybe there are people leaving, maybe there are people joining, and we want to add some names in in the meeting we're in while we're discussing changes to the application during a threat model. So all of this becomes interactive in every time that we go out and kind of touch a stakeholder, either via a meeting or a conversation on Slack. Uh, so here's a workflow that combines automation with user interaction in the loop. Uh, this is Ryan Huber's distributed alerting. Uh, this is a video of the user experience uh, built by the man and the legend, Gigi, who you've already met. So let's have a quick look at what's going on here. Uh, so this is distributed alerting. Um, what's going to happen in a mere moment is... So this is an alert that's come in. It's been triggered by something going off, being put into ELK, and an uh, uh, alert in a Lambda function seeing that data in ELK. And it sent it to George saying, hey, we've seen an unauthorized login. Uh, it's come from a non-company uh, IP address. Here's the date. Uh, it used the method password. Um, can you please let me know? So this is him just indicating here. This is now synced to JIRA, right? So that's auto-synced. You can see the workflow there is in progress. Usually, this would be an alert that we would have to go triage, right? Figure out, like, hey, was it you? But thankfully, George is going to click, this was me, and that is going to update our workflow to not only log that the person clicked it was them and to say that it was them that clicked it, it's also going to change the workflow, close the event, and we don't have to touch it. All that's had to happen there is a user has had to do an interaction which they're very used to doing, which is going to a Slack channel and responding with a single click. Um, so these are kind of workflows that you can begin to build, um, and they can be much, much more complex than this. Once you get into it, really, your imagination is the limit, um, and uh, then it's just a question of figuring out who wrote the code and maintaining it. So uh, what this enables in the long run is micropopulation analysis. Uh, don't worry about the details on this slide. The main takeaway here is what you've just seen begins to enable us to understand better a specific set of users who have a specific pattern of life within our business. Um, and we can use data as a security team to better understand their reality. So let's say we have a shared email account which multiple users access. With normal detections, all we would see is a detection against that account. But with the workflow you've just seen, because there is someone who goes and clicks that and acknowledges that that was them, uh, what we then begin to see is actually alerts against a specific user for that inbox. And we begin to build up that pattern of alerts. For example, if this person is burning the midnight oil, seems to be working 24-7 because their colleagues are on holiday, frankly, that might be data that HR should get. right? So there's a huge amount of benefit we can begin to give other parts of the organization um, by doing this. Um, the aim here, however, and I, I just want to stress this, uh, is not to be a 1984-esque security team. We want to use data to better understand the business process so that if we do need to apply controls to it, Hopefully, we give ourselves every opportunity to minimize friction or avoid it altogether. Uh, this is a work for progress. Um, essentially, um, someone here reports a vulnerability. Alert goes into Slack. Risk team get notified. Risk team explore it. Risk team link stuff to stuff. They then change some data in Jupyter. So this is, more, you know, this is, at the moment, a great example of where we have a much more involved manual workflow that we're trying to identify opportunities to automate. Uh, but basically, what, how we want it to end is that the exec gets sent that neat slide deck in a Slack channel to go, yes, I accept the risk, or no, please have a meeting with me. Uh, so um, if we can use feedback loops from these kind of interactions, perhaps this actually gives us a better pattern for what risk appetite truly is because what we're doing here is we're mapping and creating a system of record for the decisions that our business is taking about issues that they have in the real world. Uh, so this becomes a great proxy for understanding different risk appetites as they exist across our business. Uh, the code for all this is here. Uh, we've created a fake mini company, um, a serverless version of Jira. Um, there's basically you know, incidents, alert, people, roles, everything that you've seen today in this demo exists in this environment. Um, you can go have a play with it. The integrations with Slack and Jira aren't out of the box yet. Uh, watch this space as we begin to develop it out. Um, but basically, you know, feel free to go have a play. Uh, it's a graph database that you can mess around with and begin to see whether or not there is stuff that's there that's useful for your business. So, I think I've got 13 minutes left. 
Um, probably not going to get through all the slides, which frankly, a good thing. Um, but the reason that we wrote this deck was actually to provide almost like a book, right? So you know, this, this is designed to be the guide to the thinking as other teams kind of, you know, if they want to go on this journey or are on this journey, you go, oh, that's interesting. We're like, wow, that was wrong, and you shouldn't do that, um, which, of course, we would love to know because, again, you know, we, we then don't have to make mistakes. But let's whiz quickly through the ontology section, see how far we get, um, and uh, take a look at it. So uh, ontology uh, is really, obviously, kind of at the core of graph thinking. Um, it's a set of concepts and categories uh, which show properties and their relationships. So uh, the one we've arrived at uh, in our knowledge graph has evolved over time. It is definitely not a butterfly at the moment. And this section of the talk gives you an overview of the evolution process and some learnings. Let's start with some early work that we are ashamed to put on our kitchen fridge. Uh, so this is a flow diagram of our instant response process about eight months ago. There's a blog online about this uh, if you search for it. Um, the highlighted areas just show the different JIRA tickets we'd raise across this workflow. And frankly, while this created a varying amount of administrative overhead during an incident, uh, from, oh, this is OK, to, Dennis, I will never work in this way again, um, the detail it enabled us to capture was really invaluable, both for post-incident reviews, a look at what went well and what needed improving, as well as for capturing knowledge about all the business context that we have. So early on, we were using graph uh, just to kind of map out our incidents right in PIR and go right how many questions did we have to ask against a thread um, you know how how many how were th what threads got connected to each other uh, did we successfully complete the incident or not um, unfortunately loads of really valuable data was getting lost and it was getting lost in the place that we capture incident tasks which is the description field the free text description field in JIRA this was immensely frustrating because incidents would pull on lots of threads across the business and there was no good way to weave this data together uh, we began experimenting and after realizing how damn expensive it is to refactor node and edge ontologies in JIRA, because at that point we did not have Jupyter and I was doing this manually late at night, uh, much to the frustration of my very patient wife, um, uh, we moved to plant UML. And this made it cheaper to discard mistakes and rebuild the graph differently. But frankly, the results weren't helping. Almost everything was linking to everything. Uh, and while we developed some key components of the graph during this uh, challenging phase, overall things were getting more confusing. Uh, when people would say that looks complicated, Dennis would buoy our spirits, for which I thank him to this day, pointing out the complexity we were creating was a reflection of a complicated reality. Uh, but that didn't change the fact that our system of nodes and edges was increasingly hard to work for. Uh, this is an example of the nodes we have in just one project, and we have multiple. And that was before you got to the problem of deciding what edges to use to link what nodes. And while our graph certainly lacked nothing in terms of freedom of expression, the consequence was inconsistency, which made it incredibly hard to navigate the graph and ask it questions with the confidence that you were seeing all the data that you wanted. The result was confusion in our own team, let alone when we tried to use the data to communicate with the business. And to a large extent, frankly, this was because our graph had become removed from operational reality. Our nodes and edges reflected abstract concepts that we were trying to mold together that didn't make sense to anyone outside our team. And for some of us, you know, not even those that were in it or indeed creating them after a while. So forcing functions are funny things, and just as incident response have been a trigger for us to work in grass with practical and beneficial results at operational level, budget season helped us to make an evolutionary jump in a more strategic direction. One of the many challenges we face in security teams at budget season is articulating effectively what won't be done, either based on the investment the business is giving us and prepared to make, or the, our security team's ability to actually operationalize the budget we're given. So we began focusing on the function of data to solve this problem, drawing some inspiration from the Bauhaus movement, our need for fact-based narrative was clear. Uh, we needed a common theme of questions um, and the, the things that were coming our way needed to be translated into business context without requiring a human to sit there. So in classic two-choice presentation style, we stole an idea from a friend of mine who works in management consultancy who once said there are only two presentations that you give to management. Cloudy day, sunny day, in which things are bad, but if you do X, Y, Z things, they will get better. And sunny day, cloudy day, things seem good, but they won't stay that way. Uh, and so <laughs> once we... Once we started to develop narratives like this one uh, here, uh, when we transfer them to our graphs, all of a sudden the graphs began to get a lot simpler and a lot cleaner. Even when our plot lines got a lot more complicated and had a lot more actors in them, uh, we were confident that the storylines were still confident to track, and we cycled back to JIRA and began implementing the ontology we trialed. Uh, while our nodes and edges often did not correspond to a human-readable version of the storylines we were telling, that mattered less and less because you could read those stories across the data in the graph. The nouns and verbs that we needed uh, were becoming far more human-readable, emerging through the shape of the graph, and the storylines were working really well as we went and presented them to stakeholders, even if they never saw the graph. 
Um, so began the era of the great refactoring, the informal creation of the Entropy Crushing Committee. Hello, James, if you're watching. Uh, we started standardizing and formalizing our nodes, our edges, and the relationships between them that could exist in the graph, which represented a trade-off. <laughs> yes. Um, I'll come back. Come on. Don't dial me now. Okay. So uh, we chose a rigorous structure over the ability to enter arbitrary data uh, because of these things. We wanted a logical narrative. We wanted to be human readable. We wanted a clear idea to be in someone's head of the possible outputs when they asked the graph questions. Um, this made it easy to see when data was missing. So there's nothing more helpful than knowing what isn't there when you ask about the knowledge that your collective graph has as knowing what is, especially if you have an incident and you might need to call in your colleague who works in threat modeling to do a super urgent threat model of an entire application. So thankfully, this choice fitted hand in glove with the way JIRA allows you to organize data. Uh, this is roughly how data uh, is kind of, sorry, this is a rough translation of how JIRA organizes information into graph speak. Um, happily, from an administrative perspective, this structure does support innovation. So the goal of the Entropy Crushing Committee is not to stop experimentation and innovation. It's to stop pollution of the graph that leads to not being able to ask those structured questions upon which so much of our recipe books rely. Um, this is important because change to an ontology is a feature of knowledge graphs, not a bug. Until it becomes cheap to mass refactor your knowledge graphs, however, I would highly recommend avoid uh, avoiding the pain in doing so. So, um, two quick examples of lessons learned, which I failed to learn at the time, which cost me an awful lot of sanity. Um, this is a generic version of what an incident graph can look like. Uh, this is an edge narrative from a few months ago, just to give you guys a picture of like past history, right, compared to where we are now. Um, here, just for reference, are the workflows that we associate with each of those different layers in JIRA, so that as incident tasks, facts, etc., move through their life cycle, we can track those. Uh, so I'm not going to spend long on those. Uh, one of the things that I failed miserably to capitalize on was investigating the metadata that people were adding to issue types in the knowledge graph. So here's an example from our security incident issue type, which shows all the various fields that were added over time as we tried to tag things we needed, add in details that we wanted to search for or we wanted to organize by. Uh, this is just a different view of all those fields. And what I should have done earlier was to look at those fields and ask the question, are there other issue types in other projects that could benefit from what we are trying to do? Uh, have they come up with a better way than we have to do it? Um, and is there value in creating a new node and edge relationship that bridges across our projects uh, within the graph? Had I done that, I would have probably found uh, that we were all trying to tell the same story in slightly different ways. And we could have identified what those common themes were throughout those narratives and glued them together a lot better than we did. Uh, second example of lessons learned is from the Red Team project. Uh, this is the project's ontology as it exists today. Uh, this is the narrative it supports. The ontology did not start like that. Originally, it reflected more of a very tightly constrained pen test that we called a Red Team as we began to get um, the business comfortable with testing in production on a regular basis. Um, over time, uh, our scope got a lot more free form. And as that happened, as our red teamers began to think creatively within the structure, uh, we began to introduce things like security control observations from the red team about controls that shoulda, woulda, coulda, maybe stop them quicker, faster, and cheaper when they were able to jump from one task to another or exploit or find a vulnerability. Um, and then once we got the blue team fully involved in end-to-end -end tests and evaluating findings, we began linking that concept of control coverage to the information the blue team had about IT systems and specific IT assets so that we could understand and then begin searching across our knowledge graph to see if we had similar gaps in other systems from the one um, attack path that the red team would be able to take. Because even though they only get one, you can then mine a graph to be able to see, right, okay, what are the commonalities across other systems that might indicate control gaps, control failures, um, changes in operation operational states, for example, or lack of coverage. Um, so at a certain point, it was obvious that security controls and IT systems and assets should not live in the Red Team project. Unfortunately, we developed the control ontology pretty much in isolation. Uh, we missed some major opportunities to evolve it uh, and make our data richer across all projects, uh, for example, in relation to how uh, regulators articulate controls. Uh, and when we changed it again, we had to do a lot of refactoring. So like, lesson learned, you know, get out your bubble, go speak to members of your own team uh, who are probably battling with similar things. 
it's easy to get into a, uh, a spiral of focus and, and lose the bigger perspective when you're doing this stuff. Um, so where are we today? Uh, the focus at the moment is leaving the detail behind. Our time is spent thinking about the big building blocks uh, so that we can begin to fit the detail in them in the best way. Uh, here are some examples. This is kind of the business structure ontology, which we've already seen. Here's the IT asset ontology. Uh, here's the projects. Here's um, Interactions. So once you get into the like graphing meetings is actually really valuable. Because you go, well, that decision you made that led to that task, like that task hasn't been done. And it's been three weeks. So like when you said in the meeting it would be done last week, could you move that into your workflow? So you can really begin to drive accountability through doing this. Cool, five minutes left. Uh, here's a good one for third parties. Uh, this is the kind of stuff that I want to know and link to. Uh, here's our incident one uh, as it is today. Here's the, yeah, I mean, like this is the, yeah, this is the threat model. This is still very much an evolution. There are some part, we'll come to this in a moment. There are some confusing parts through this graph that don't quite work yet. Uh, but again, like this is where we are. Right? And the, the, the goal of this is to share um, in all its imperfection what, what's going on. Um, and here's the red team project that we've already looked at. So um, the plant UML code for all of these, if you're not a coder like me, and, but you can kind of understand plant UML, um, that's all on GitHub too. So you can now go in, you can grab all these ontologies, you can experiment with them, you can change them, you can whack them back, and get back on GitHub uh, and show us what you're doing and show us um, you know, where, where we can take the next evolution. Uh, just by way of a few guiding principles, uh, here's some things that I have found helpful to avoid mass refactoring. Uh, there can be many ways to explain relationships between nodes in different projects, but there should be just a few ways to describe node relationships within projects. This is okay because the people project is separate to the instant response. I, man, tell me about it. Like, if you feel, <laughs> it's just, it's just kind of goes like, <sighs> so I know it's a lot of information. I apologize. Um, it'll be over in three minutes though. Um, so for, for both of us, like I can't. I just need, I need a beer. I need to go and cry in a corner. Um, so. Uh, this would not be okay. This is not a good uh, example of ontology. Next, be careful of node to edge paths that create unstable narratives. So here's a great example. You start building your knowledge graph. This incident uh, used a vector. Threat actor in this incident used a vector and caused that impact. Right there, it's super clear what's happened. Bad things happen when you start linking through non-mutually exclusive relationships because the context for which node links to which node quickly disappears and you have no idea of which storyline links to which storyline. Uh, finally, look for node to edge joins that create narratives with the fewest number of touch points. So here's a great example. Uh, this is just you know random example like Joe Bloggs, who works for I don't even know what it is, Acme Metals. Uh, he reports an incident. If the incident concerns an application, uh, Plant UML does weird things with the actual way that visuals are laid out. You just kind of have to live with that. Um, Here's a, a link into the application, so we can begin seeing that. Um, and then this example, which is kind of cool. Um, so what we're doing here is we're actually saying we ran a project. So for example, if you run a project to do technology oversight, right, and investigate, say, um, a firewall you have, or you know, maybe a WAF, um, you might find a bunch of issues with that WAF, right? And those vulnerabilities can then be articulated to the business in terms of the things they affect, and they can be linked to the people that need to make decisions about those risks. And what we can then do is propose another project that says, hey, if you want to fix these things, this project is going to do these tasks over this time period to deliver that shift. Um, and in that way, um, you can begin uh, to um, articulate the movement of time and resources through the graph that allows the business to understand where its money is going. And then at the end of the year, all you need to do is basically say, well, like, here's the graphs and here's how we've changed them. This is basically where your money's gone, which is very, very helpful and stops the usual kind of zero budget thing that everyone has to do going back to the beginning and building everything up in a nightmare of Excel. Um, that said, sometimes you just have to accept that security makes a mess out of everything. Uh, here is a project migration graph before security gets involved. And here's what it looks like after you've started adding in what I reckon are like fairly minimum uh, set of relationships in the threat model. Um, so in closing, I think I've just got time, hopefully for this like two minutes. Uh, what next? I have been thinking a lot about this quote recently uh, from my friend Dan um, about how to put graphs in context. Um, one of the reasons that we rely so much on this industry, in this industry on generic patterns of play and best practices is there is no widely shared knowledge base that helps us identify the right pattern of play for our business. Despite the allure of consultants selling us what good looks like, there is no single repeatable pattern. It's more like playing 50 games of chess and changes on one board affect all the others as we desperately try to tailor our strategy and operating model to deliver stage appropriate results and build the boat while we're rowing it. It's very hard to understand, I find, in a given moment what the best choice is we have. If we lack a picture of the landscape and every visit to SFO reminds me of this, a short geographical distance that does not count for hills may not be the smartest route. Uh, Simon Wardley has written a lot on maps and patterns of play. Um, 
When we think about the inputs and the outputs within controls that rely on data and analytics, and we think about what that would look like if we started connecting it to the business, perhaps what we need to do is to start considering and combining graphs and maps to understand where we need to put the focus of our investment and those data scientists that we are hiring and who are trying to do such great work for us. For example, if the internal feedback loop in our SOC <laughs> looks like this, and the one for our red team looks like this, and the data feedback between these two controls involves this, then maybe the smart place to invest is here. And sorry, incidentally, along the bottom axis, what you're seeing is things move from genesis, a state of kind of unstable creation, into commodity at the end. Um, so we have a bunch of ideas on this that we just haven't had time to work on. Uh, if anyone loves graphs and maps, please get in touch. This is kind of the next phase of experimentation for us of where we're going to take stuff. Um, I'm also super excited about building the FAIR model uh, into our ontology. Um, you know, Jack Jones has uh, done some great, great work in helping us articulate risk. And I think some of the stuff we can do to, with graphs is especially helpful in quantifying unknowns uh, through the lens of Knightian uncertainty, for example, where we're actually unable to say what a risk is because we don't have the information to make that judgment. Um, last two slides. We face a really tough challenge in this industry to hit a target that's basically context dependent, moving all the time. I hope some of what we've shared today helps us all escape a common, common enemy, uh, which is the Riskatron. And uh, that's all. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope it's been uh, helpful. <laughs> I've overrun, so there are no time for questions, but I'll be around all day. So, thank you. You're going to go take a nap. Yeah, right. yeah sure. Thank you. Just drop, drop it down there. Try to keep the profanity to a minimum. Just say interesting things. <laughs> well, no, I'll do my best. No, no, it's gonna, you're going to do great. I'm cool. excited. I, I need a uh, USB-C uh, HDMI adapter. Uh, Hi. Yes, so good nice to meet you. I'm really yeah. sorry that I've overrun. I no, no, please. It's fine. I, I'm glad I at least got to catch the tail end of your talk. I've been uh, in the speaker room getting ready. So uh, it's really cool. We'll have to speak up later. And you're Gabe. Gabe. Hey, great to finally meet you in person. My pleasure too. I'm looking forward to this one as well. Awesome. Well, let's hope. Just go to the Cool. Uh, oh, USB-C. Perfect. And where's the HDMI? Blue one. OK. Cool. Thank you. It worked when I tested it. Oh. Okay. This is just okay. not twisting right. All right. All right. Well, let's I've tested it twice way. now, so. Great job again. You really. Yeah. Yeah, we'll get yeah. there. Perfect. Cool. Thank you. Um, I, uh, what? Oh, sure. Thank you. Cool. This is not happening so far. Uh, it it worked in the the speaker. Yeah, it looked exactly like that. Um, Yeah, I can try on the other side, maybe. Uh, the slides are online, if there's another device I could use. Um, but this worked in the, the speaker room. How would you prefer to be introduced? Hey. That side doesn't um, work. That side does. Magic. And I did try that side earlier, so there we go. Um, I don't know. What are my options? However uh, is cool. Name, Colin O'Brien, Insanity Colin Bit. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.
No, no, I can kind of stick to this area. Yeah. Just be aware of the speaker. That thing is Stay from this speaker. Stay on the side of projector. Oh, that speaker. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going over there. That's fine. <laughs> by Colin O'Brien. Now, right before we begin, we have just a couple of quick announcements. First of all, we'd like to thank our sponsors, especially our inner circle sponsors, Critical Stack, Bail Mail, as well as our special sponsors, Amazon, Blackberry, and Paranoids. It's support from these sponsors and other sponsors, donors, and volunteers that make this event possible. Also, this event is live streamed. So as a courtesy for the audience and for our speaker, we ask that you right now check to make sure that your phone is set on silent. Now, if you have any questions, uh, just so that our YouTube audience can hear you, we're going to ask that you use the, the question mic. Just raise your hands, and I'll be sure to bring over that microphone for you. Uh, lastly, lastly, if you have feedback for this event or the speaker, there is a survey in the shed entry for this talk. Uh, now we're ready to proceed, so please let's welcome Colin O'Brien. Awesome. All right. Uh, thank you all for coming to my talk. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm Colin O'Brien. I'm a software security engineer working at Dropbox on their detection and response team. Uh, if you're not very familiar with detection and response, the very short summed up version of my job is that I am tasked with tracking suspicious behaviors across Dropbox's various environments. If something looks particularly bad, I'm going to spend some time scoping it out, figuring out the root cause. And then if it's actually an attacker or more likely our red team, I'm going to ensure that they've been completely removed from the environment. Uh, today what I'm going to be talking about is a project that I work on outside of work. So this is not affiliated with Dropbox. Uh, it's called Grapple. Uh, Grapple is an open source graph analytics platform that targets detection and response work. Uh, graph is kind of the key word there. I'm going to be talking about sort of a graph-based approach to detection and response uh, from a higher level, as well as how Grapple leverages that to make a lot of the things that I do at my job a lot faster and more ergonomic. So before I jump into what Grapple is, let's just do a very quick overview of graphs. Uh, graphs are a data structure, just like a list, array, hash map. They hold onto information. Graphs are composed of nodes and edges. Uh, nodes are going to be, oh, shoot, is it not updating? OK, I'm going to do it like this. Cool. That, that should help. Uh, so nodes are um, entities or things, nouns, right? Uh, you could imagine a person maps very nicely to a node. Edges are going to be those lines in between them. They denote relationships between nodes. As an example, you might have two person nodes and an edge between them because they are friends. Uh, graphs are a really powerful data structure for a whole number of reasons. I think one of the easiest ways to demonstrate that is with a very empty, plain graph like this, right? There's no explicit labels. There's not a lot of data here. But even still, I can say a lot of interesting things about this graph. I can say things like the purple node has a relationship with the green and the blue node. And the green node has a relationship with the blue node. And the reason I can do this is because of a really great property of graphs where they encode information about relationships into their structure itself. That's going to make them a, a very powerful uh, visualization tool. But that same property is going to come up in a lot of different places. Okay, Graphs are, uh, they're out of sync here. Uh, graphs are a really powerful 
uh, data structure. So of course, all these different companies are leveraging them. Google's Knowledge Graph powers their search engine. Uh, Facebook's Graph API is what underlies all of their public APIs. Graphs are also leveraged in uh, things like TensorFlow uh, as part of the, the way that the representation of its computation is. So TensorFlow is a form of data flow programming, which means it executes as a graph. Uh, for context, TensorFlow is a machine learning library uh, that was able to power AlphaGo and defeat all the top Go board game players. And that was a, a really big deal when that happened. Uh, graphs also tend to be very emergent. Uh, so BGP uh, and the internet, right, is essentially a graph of routers communicating with each other and packets sort of traverse that graph and that just sort of sprung about. Given that all these companies are leveraging graphs for these different use cases, it makes a lot of sense uh, that uh, the security community has started paying more attention to them. A couple of years ago, John Lambert at Microsoft wrote a post about some of the areas where he sees graphs and security. In this post, Lambert makes a, a very bold claim. He states, defenders think in lists, attackers think in graphs. So long as this is true, attackers win. Lambert then goes on to give an example of this list and graph-based thinking. He talks about how when defenders are given a network to protect, uh, one of the first things they'll do is start creating lists, such as who are the domain admins, who are the uh, high-value users, what are the risky assets. Right? And from this work, they'll begin uh, prioritizing what they're going to do to defend that network. This is very different from how attackers go about doing their job. Attackers will gain a foothold on whatever asset they can actually get their hands on. Uh, they're going to leverage the capabilities of that asset, such as by dumping uh, credentials from memory using tools like Mimikatz. And then they'll begin abusing the trust relationships of your users and your network to move laterally across it. According to Lambert, this mismatch in approach is so fundamentally bad for defenders that we simply cannot get around it without a shift in thinking. At the end of Lambert's post, he has this quote. He says, manage from reality because that is the prepared defender's mindset. So I think if you, if you read that post and you think about what he's talking about and you try to get that, that fundamental reality, I think there is a more generalized concept here which is that if you take information that fits really cleanly into one data structure, such as a graph, uh, and then you try to force it into another data structure, like a list, you lose information. You make certain operations less optimal. In this case, we're losing that, that trust relationship information that a graph makes very clear, but a list completely removes. Uh, OK, that slide is dead. Uh, cool. Uh, Bloodhound is a tool uh, that I think has really managed to, um, let me, give me one moment, I'm going to see if I can move this over. Yep. This is why I have two tabs open. Cool. So, oh, this is the speaker view. Okay, I have three tabs open. Just <laughs> <laughs> backups for my backups. Okay, cool. <laughs> very prepared. So uh, <laughs> I think Bloodhound is a really great demonstration of this graph-based approach. Uh, Bloodhound allows you to visualize your Active Directory structures so that you can move from a world where you do things like, um, say, who are my domain admins, and start asking questions like, what are the paths to my domain admin? And it does this by visualizing all of your Active Directory data as a, as a graph and letting you query it as a graph. So that's a really fundamental shift in how you do that work. It's a, it's a new capability altogether when you start thinking in that way. So in detection response, uh, sort of the fundamental primitive that we use for our work is the log. Logs are these digital representations of events across a network. What we do is we index billions and billions of these logs every single day, collecting them and storing them in what's called a SIM, which is effectively just a giant list of logs. And we'll search through that list of logs, trying to find suspicious behaviors. And if we find them, we go back to those other logs to pivot off them and get other behaviors, right? So everything is, is based on this log construct. Now, if you pull out a couple of logs, right, and you put them next to each other, like I have here, uh, you can start to see that there's actually these implicit relationships between them, right? I can see that the parent PID in one log and the PID in another actually matches with a parent PID in a different log, right? When you start pulling these relationships out and turning them into graphs, it becomes very obvious what's going on. We're exposing not just the event in isolation, but we're telling a whole story about what's happening here. We're seeing those relationships. We're seeing those behaviors. 
So this is really what Grapple is all about. Uh, what Grapple aims to do is what a sim does with logs, Grapple wants to do with graphs. So your detection work, your response work, scoping, all of that's going to be graph-based. Grapple runs in an AWS account. Uh, so after you set it up, what you'll do is send it uh, some raw logs. Uh, Grapple supports Sysmon as well as a more generic JSON format that you can target. Uh, Grapple will do very much what we saw on that last slide. It's going to pull out a subgraph representation based on those logs, mapping things like PIDs to nodes. It'll perform some identification steps uh, because we want canonical identities. We don't want to think in PIDs. We want to think about you know, a, a node, uh, a process being a node as, as a self-contained, identifiable construct. Um, these identified subgraphs get merged into a giant master graph. So there's this graph database that's constantly in real time being updated, representing all the entities and behaviors across your network. As that master graph is being built and updated, Grapple will orchestrate the execution of your attack signatures, uh, or what Grapple calls analyzers. And those are going to perform a, a sort of pattern matching and query that master graph for suspicious behaviors. And finally, when enough analyzers go off and you decide that this is something you need to investigate, Grapple provides a tool called an engagement, and that's going to allow you to really quickly pivot across your logs and fully scope an attacker's behaviors. So I'm going to be going over how all of this works, um, sort of the graph-based fundamental uh, behind it, um, and, and just try to give you a high-level overview of what Grapple is able to do. So when I talk about that master graph, uh, I'm really talking about what you see here, at least today. Uh, there are some core provided uh, graph abstractions. We have things like processes, files, external IP addresses, and connections to them, right? So we can represent all of these things in our graph today. In the very near future, uh, this should actually all work. It just has to go to master. Uh, I can do things like provide asset nodes as well as uh, internal network communication, which would be really great for lateral movement detections. Uh, beyond that, Grapple provides a dynamic node construct, which the plugin system uses. I'll go into that later, but uh, essentially you can just expand this graph uh, with plugins however you want. You can see that nodes are pretty standard. Processes have things like process names. Files have paths. And then there are these sort of special edges, these special properties, like a process has children or files that it's created, right? And those edges point to a list of other nodes. So this is, this is what Grapple is under the hood. So I mentioned that uh, there's an identification stage. Uh, this ends up solving a lot of really important problems that a log-based system will have. Uh, the two problems I run into with logs um, are that, uh, for one thing, PIDs, uh, those pseudo-identifiers, process IDs, they get reused. They're not actually really good identifiers. It's the same thing with file paths, right? If I create a file and delete it, and then you know, some attacker puts a file there, it's important to realize that those are two distinct entities. So uh, one thing that instrumentation tools like Sysmon uh, will provide is a process GUID construct. Uh, so you don't have to worry about PID collisions. You get true identity. Uh, but it doesn't solve the second problem I have, which is that when I want to understand some kind of construct like a process, I, I will search for that process GUID, right? And OK, no more uh, PID collisions. But I'm going to have to comb through tens or even hundreds of log lines just to understand what it's doing. There's tons of redundancy in between there. If you've seen a Sysmon log, probably 70% of that data is duplicated across every log. Uh, so what Grapple is going to do is much like Sysmon, it'll generate a canonical identifier for any logs that you send up, uh, not just Windows, but anything Grapple can uh, parse. Uh, and then it's going to coalesce all of the unique information into just one place, one node, right? And that canonical identifier is called a node key. I'm going to talk very quickly about uh, one method of identification, just so you can kind of internalize what this looks like. Um, this is session-based identification. Sessions are things like processes or files. Uh, they have a pseudo-identifier like a PID or a path, but it's only good for a period of time uh, when the process has started uh, all the way until it's ended, right? The way Grapple solves uh, identification is it will look at logs like process creation or termination logs, and it'll start building up timelines for every pseudo-identifier for every asset. Here you can see that there's two process creation logs. Uh, and so we can say that PID 250 on this asset uh, has 
the ID zero for the time span of 20 to 50, and then there was another process creation log, so we know that there must be a new entity from 50 to wherever that next log is. When this other log comes in, because the process has actually done something, to find its identity, we just look it up in the timeline. Now keep in mind that Grapple is going to handle all of these crazy edge cases for you. Um, one obvious one is that uh, your instrumentation might start up after a lot of your processes have already started. So you'll never get those process creation logs. There's a lot of uh, heuristics and other work that goes into handling those cases, but this is the happy path and this is what identification means in Grapple. All right, let's talk about detection. So log-based detection, I think, tends to drive us towards uh, properties or artifacts, right? We will look for hashes, um, and we might even look for things like command line arguments. I think the command line argument example is a really, uh, really useful one because command line arguments aren't actually interesting. Attackers can change them, they can use other binaries with different command line arguments, or bring their own binaries, right? Uh, what we're using command line arguments for when we use logs to build rules is as a proxy for the underlying behavior. I don't care that you know, curl executes with dash f, I care that the attacker is sending a file off of the box. That's the foundation. And logs don't do a very good job of exposing those, those uh, core behaviors. On top of that, those sims, uh, the, the indexes, uh, kind of punish you for writing searches that have to look at more than one log at a time. Uh, so if I want to pivot in part of my rule going from uh, an execution log over to a network log over to something else, uh, the sim might actually just break if I try to do that. Uh, joining performance is, is generally something that uh, starts getting exponential very quickly. One demonstration of where this relationship-based rule uh, would be really helpful uh, is if we have these two logs here. Uh, these are just two process creation logs. One is for Word and one is for PowerShell. Now these are both uh, valid digitally signed Microsoft binaries. They are almost certainly executing in the vast majority of environments. Yes, PowerShell is a tool that attackers like to use, uh, but so do system admins. And again, if we, if we put these logs next to each other, we can see that there is this implicit relationship, right? And when we turn this into a graph, I can see that it's not Word or PowerShell or any properties of those processes that I really want to build a rule around. It is the fact that Word is executing PowerShell. It is actually the hidden information that I care the most about in this case. And even more so, it's not Word and PowerShell uh, being, having that relationship. It's, it's really just the fact that there is a, uh, an assumption that two processes shouldn't have a relationship in this environment, right? So the more generalized structure-based query that we want to get to is tracking things like unique parent-child executions. When you start uh, designing your attacks as if they are graphs, I think the attack signatures become really obvious. Uh, we have uh, executions uh, of Word talking to uh, a non-whitelisted IP address, right? This is going to be kind of property heavy, uh, but the properties are more of an optimization to increase our sense of risk. We can also use uh, more generalized searches, like the one I, I talked about earlier, the unique parent-child process. Uh, more complex searches that require multiple hops, right? Or even some causal analysis, like we have here a uh, a process that has talked to an external IP address and then it created a file and then it executed that file. Building that kind of rule in a log-based system is prohibitively difficult. Uh, you wouldn't reach for that kind of rule because you would know it would be painful. So my opinion is that this graph-based approach that we've sort of designed here is already strictly better than a log-based approach. I can take advantage of properties when I want to take advantage of properties. Um, and that's, that's great, that, that word.exe talking to evil.com, right? I'm, I'm thinking a lot about specifics there, but I can also track fundamental attacker behaviors. If an attacker has to worry about process executions being unique, you are changing how an attacker is going after your network. Of course, the truth is that we have to treat uh, that really nice crafted word uh, with a, an anomalous connection very differently than the uh, parent-child process anomaly, right? One of those is going to happen hopefully never, uh, but the parent-child process one could happen fairly often in your environment. And so for this reason, we introduce a concept of risk, right? Now I'm essentially labeling the, the master graph saying these small pieces here are very risky and these other pieces here are not that risky, right? So again, 
Uh, this is a, a nice improvement. This fits more with my mental model of how I want to track attacker behaviors and make their life harder. Still, there's one more level that we kind of want to get to. Uh, as an example, what if it happens to be the case that Word talked to a non-whitelisted domain and also Word has a unique parent-child relationship? I don't want to have to write a whole new signature for that. I already have two signatures here, right? I want those to just automatically compose together. So for this reason, Grapple has a concept of an asset uh, lens or a username lens. Uh, these, these lens nodes allow you to view uh, otherwise isolated risks uh, under a, a specific concept like a username or computer. So here we can see that all of these independent risks uh, that I had uh, started tracking actually overlap. And I can take that overlap into account when I'm describing the asset lens risk itself, right? I can say that this specific computer uh, is not just the sum of the risks under it, but also add a, a multiplier, like an extra 10% for every node that overlaps, right? Because that's extra sketchy when these things are, are overlapping. So the actual implementation of this is going to be in Python. That's the language that you would use to write these analyzers. I chose Python for a number of reasons. Uh, my experience with query language and, and domain-specific languages that uh, are very common in the state-of-the-art systems is that they front load a lot of their power. Um, they're really uh, purpose-built for specific scenarios. And anytime you try to move into some other scenario, uh, they really start fighting back. You get uh, performance problems. You get huge, huge queries because you can't abstract things away. You compare that with something like Python. Python is an extremely general purpose language. I think it's probably fair to say that it's the language of choice for a large part of both the data science and the security communities. You can build out powerful abstractions, and you're never going to feel particularly limited by Python, in my opinion. So analyzers in Grapple are these flat Python files that you'll deploy. Um, these will get called on every single update to the master graph. So it, this is a, a real-time system. There's no uh, search query um, like periods or anything like that. Uh, it's just going to happen on every single update. This function will get called and passed in a client to talk to the master graph. Uh, you will get a node view. Node views are a concrete representation of some node that already exists in the graph. And then a sender, which we'll use to emit hits. So this analyzer here is going to look for suspicious executions of processes because their parent process is Word, right? We don't expect Word to be uh, creating sub-processes. So this process only involves, um, I'm sorry, this query only involves processes. So if it's not a process node, we're just going to ignore it. Like if this is a file node or a network node, this, it's not relevant to this signature. Uh, we'll create our process query. Uh, we will constrain it by saying that it has to have the name winword.exe. Uh, and it, it has to have some children, which we won't constrain, because there's, there's no whitelisting here to do. Any child process is going to be suspicious to me, and I want to track it. I'll then call query first and pass it the client. And I also pass it the node key for the node that was passed into us, for the node that was just recently updated. That's really important, because that allows this query to execute in constant time. So you might be thinking, this graph is going to have you know, billions and billions of nodes, and this analyzer is going to get executed over and over again uh, you know, hundreds of times in, in a, a minute easily. Um, but it's always going to execute in the exact same amount of time, or, or roughly speaking, because it's a constant time operation. Uh, you're going to notice that that's a trend in operations in Grapple. They will always be constant time whenever possible. The reality is that we collect more and more data every single year. It's um, even just having linear uh, access times, it's not going to scale to next year when I've doubled the amount of volume, right? So if we get a response back, uh, we will emit the execution hit. I'll give it a name. I'll give it a risk score, and I'll say what that, uh, the, the concrete node was that I'm considering to be sketchy, right? So I pass in P. And uh, you know, this, is, this is pretty bad, so give it a risk score, a score of uh, 90, right? Uh, one example of how Python is able to provide us with these powerful abstractions is that uh, we can leverage this parent-child counter that uh, Grapple provides. This is just a specialized interface. It's going to encapsulate all this nice logic for us and just expose a single method called get count for. We don't have to worry about how this works under the hood. There's actually a lot to it. For example, there's actually a Redis connection uh, for this parent-child counter. So in the vast majority of cases, because of the constrained API, uh, we actually don't even have to talk to the graph database to get these counts. 
This is just an example of how you can build really powerful, reusable constructs in a way that most sims are not going to allow you to. And so we can also build out these more complex queries. Here we have uh, a signature for processes uh, that have a binary file, where that binary file was created by what I'm calling an unpacker, something like 7-zip or WinRAR. Now here we've got a really uh, low risk score, right? I'm calling this 15. If you try to spend uh, your time whitelisting something like this, you're just going to waste hours or days. You're never going to whitelist something like this because new software uh, will be deployed and it's going to use this sort of approach. But it's still an interesting behavior that I want to track in my environment. So I can move away from thinking about whitelisting in black and white situations of good and evil and just say that, you know, let's track this. And if it correlates with something else, we get that nice multiplier because of lenses. Uh, and I don't have to waste my time, right? That's really important. I spend a lot of time on whitelisting searches that would just be better served if I could downgrade them. I think maybe the best part about leveraging tools like Python is that you get to benefit from best practices, standard practices, right? If you compare the number of people who are writing uh, you know, uh, Elasticsearch's query language or Splunk's query language to the number of people writing Python, it's orders of magnitude difference. If you start Googling how to write a unit test for Splunk, you're not going to get very nice results. You will find that it is entirely unsupported. Uh, compare that to Python. Your standard library, just import unit test. That's it, right? We can already start building out testing infrastructure. I can deploy this code to GitHub, which Grapple supports via Git hooks. Uh, I can add linters, code reviews. I can roll back and revert changes if they're broken, continuous integration, right? Uh, my opinion is that as an incident response team starts to scale, alert management is one of these problems that's going to start creeping up on you more and more, and you're going to say, I thought we had an alert for that, and it turns out that it was actually just broken the whole time. You didn't have tests for it. So this is a, a huge value add for actually managing the searches that you're creating. Cool. I'm going to talk about uh, investigations. So log-based investigations usually start off with one or more logs and maybe a ticket that tells me why I should care about the information in this log, right? So here maybe uh, you know that that hash is just known to be bad for some reason. Uh, the way I usually start off an investigation like this, I'm going to take a look at the suspect process, see what it's done, uh, but I'm not going to spend too long on it. I'm immediately going to start tracing it backwards and find the root cause and see where this thing came from. So what I'll do is I'll open up a search window in my sim, say the last eight hours, right, somewhere around a business day, uh, and I'll pick a field to, to start looking over. So let's, let's look at the PID, right? I want to see what this process has done. And I'll get like tens or hundreds of logs back. Maybe I get too many and I have to spend some time cutting it down. But okay, I've got a, a general idea of what this thing is doing. It doesn't look great. Not an obvious false positive. Time to start tracing it backwards. Let's look at the parent PID. Uh, maybe I find that the parent PID is something like launch D or cron, right? It's legitimate. This is a dead end. The attacker has set this up to execute in a week or two weeks, right? So I'll start looking for that file. That's the only thing I can start pivoting off of. I'll search for the file's hash, right? And I don't get anything back. Not great, but okay, there are a lot of reasons why that might happen. I'll try the image name, but I'm still not getting anything. Clearly this file was dropped a long time ago. I'm not getting any new logs back. So what I have to do at this point is extend my search window back. And now you can see I've got some logs related to that image name, which is great, but I'm paying a very serious cost. These are linear searches at best, which means that if I extend my search window by uh, doubling it, let's say, every search from this point forward is now twice as slow. On top of that, and, and really much worse, is that I now have PID collisions. Uh, PID collisions, in my experience, for a client laptop, if they are running Chrome in particular, uh, are going to happen basically every couple of hours. If my investigation is going days, it is essentially a guarantee. PID collisions suck. They are really annoying to deal with. Uh, you have to start saying PID after this time, but not before this time, stuff like that. It's really painful, uh, and it's because logs don't have that strong sense of identity. So there's clearly a, a couple of other problems here. Um, one of the problems that's maybe a little harder to see is that I don't actually have a good idea for how I'm pivoting. I want to know more things about that file. Really, I just want to know what created it. But all I've got is this hash. I'm just going to hope that that hash shows up somewhere in other logs. I don't know that I'm pivoting to the information that I want. And I don't know if it's on the other side. Switch tabs. 
Let's see what we got. Oh, wow, that's not good. Do, do, do. Get a replay of the talk. Almost there. Oh, come on. Oh. All right, sorry, bear with me with exactly two minutes while uh, the speaker Wi-Fi is not working uh, for me. And so I'm going to tether to my phone, uh, which will just take less than 30 seconds. I apologize. Tethering, mobile hotspot. Let's connect to the Wi-Fi. And reload. Cool. Not what I was hoping for. OK, that should do it. I, again, apologize for that. And it's going to be slow Wi-Fi at that, so. Uh, spoilers. <laughs> cool, OK, so that didn't take too long. Uh, Grapple takes a completely different approach to investigations from this. Uh, at the heart of Grapple's investigation process is the Jupyter Notebook. In this room, maybe some people are familiar with that. Essentially, it's this uh, Python environment that you can interact with in your browser. Uh, you can do all these crazy things. You can split your Python code up into these cells. You can inline markdown, uh, upload images, um, replay different cells. Uh, it's a really powerful tool. And importantly, it is the tool that uh, the data science community has been leveraging for years. My opinion is that uh, the detection and response field has a lot of intersections with the data science field. We do a lot of the same work. We're all just trying to hunt through data to find something that looks like signal, right? So we should be paying attention to what that looks like here. Oh, man, wrong tab. Killing me. Start presenting. Yes. Cool. Okay. So Grapple has a sort of two browser pane user experience. Uh, on one pane, you will have a live updating view of your engagement. The engagement graph that you see here uh, just contains two nodes. One represents the engagement and metadata around it. The other is this svchost.exe. As I mentioned earlier, we don't have to comb through hundreds of logs. I can see every unique piece of information about that SVC host right there at the bottom. It's all in one place for me. At the bottom of the screen, you can see sort of an excerpt from a Jupyter notebook where I actually instantiated this engagement called demo. And then I pulled in a node based on its process, uh, its, its uh, node key, right? I can't really show both panes at once very easily. Uh, so I'm going to show you the engagement and then the graph. Uh, essentially, we're going to kick this thing off. I'm going to do exactly the same workflow as before. I want to understand what a process has done. One of the most important things to me is what children processes has it executed. So I'll say, uh, get the children for this process, and I'll just you know, print out their process names. And I can see command.exe three times. So this thing is shelling out to some sub-processes through command. Obviously really sketchy. Again, this is a constant time operation. Doesn't matter how much data is involved. Doesn't matter if command.exe was executed months or a year later. Uh, constant time lookups for these edges. All of these get underscore methods are also causing that uh, live updating graph view to pull in those new nodes, uh, which you'll see in a moment. So let's keep going. Let's trace this process backwards. I'll go up its process tree. We can see its parent is command.exe, uh, which you would see in the graph. And there's a, a grandparent process, which is called dropper.exe. And we can keep going. And eventually, we'll see that the user downloaded this dropper.exe uh, from Chrome. This is what the graph ends up looking like. And it's a pretty nice story, right? We can say that the user executed Chrome from Explorer. Uh, Chrome uh, executed this dropper process. Uh, we've got dropper shelling out to SVC host, and then SVC host shelling out to these other command.exe. And this is what it looks like, right? So as you're typing in the commands on the right side, you're going to see all of those nodes automatically just get pulled in on the left side. So we've solved a lot of those problems that we talked about with the logging system, right? I'm not fighting my data anymore. I don't have to worry how much data is there because it's all constant time operations. There's no search windows, right? Before, I really wanted to keep my search windows small so that my queries would run fast. But I also wanted my search window to be as large as possible so that I could search over the most relevant data. 
Here, that's, that's a non-issue. We don't even think about search windows. I have identity, so I don't have to look at multiple logs or nodes. I just look in one place, and I can see all of the unique relevant information. And I have my pivot points. If I want the children, I just ask for the children. I say, get children, right? I don't have to search for the child PIDs or anything like that and hope that I get the information back. So that's all the, the sort of graph stuff for Grapple. Um, that's the detection and the response and the identification of it. There is also another important word with Grapple, and that is that it is a platform. Uh, Grapple does not intend to solve every single problem on its own. That would be silly. Instead, it is built to be very modular and extendable, and it actually provides a plugin system on top of that. Everything in Grapple works through uh, event submission uh, or, or receiving. So you have these AWS lambdas. Those are just serverless compute functions. They get triggered every time something is uploaded to specific uh, AWS S3 buckets. That's just a storage interface. Uh, and they can read and write to these buckets and evit, uh, emit new events. Right? So it's very easy to extend because if I want to add, say, a custom parser, all I have to do is subscribe to the right event stream. Grapple provides a plugin system for this. Uh, the plugin system is still in early stages, uh, but this is fairly representative. It'll only get better from here. Um, there are three main components to building a plugin for a net new source type. Uh, in this case, I'm going to walk you through what it looks like to set it up for uh, AWS Guard Duty. That's an Amazon offering where you pay them money, and they send you logs to tell you when something bad is happening in your environment. So we're going to build a, a subgraph generator. It's going to parse logs and turn them into graphs. That's what you see here. We're going to build that, uh, that query construct, like we saw that process query, right? We want to be able to build analyzers around these EC2 instances and guard duty alerts, uh, as well as a view construct so that we can represent the concrete uh, nodes in that graph. Uh, the first component is going to be built in Rust. The other two are built in Python. I do not expect anyone to be particularly Rust savvy. Uh, this is just pretty simple code. It's mostly boilerplate, and the macros are going to take care of a lot of it. So, uh, so what we're going to do here is just focus on this AWS EC2 instance. You can see at the top here, I'm just going to put whatever properties exist in the node uh, for this. Uh, you can see there's an ARN. That's the AWS resource name. It uniquely identifies that resource every EC2 instance or IAM user. Anything in AWS always has a strictly unique identifier. We also have a launch time, and there's all these other properties that I've omitted here just for screen space. I've added a macro that is not showing up super well on there, gray on gray, uh, but essentially what we're saying here is turn this structure into a dynamic node, right? That dynamic node is a construct that Grapple knows how to understand, and we'll identify that node using a static strategy. So earlier you saw the session-based strategy, uh, static strategy easier. It's just a lookup. We can say the R maps exactly to its uh, canonical ID, right? That macro is going to generate two things for us. One is the dynamic node uh, version of that structure. So it'll be AWS EC2 instance node, and then an interface for that structure. Implementing that interface is pretty trivial. It is one method, and it is always the same exact code. And that's going to basically allow Grapple to do all these things on top of that node. Everything from here is pretty simple. Uh, we get logs, we parse them using a standard JSON parsing library, we get a structure out, we create our node, we just instantiate it by calling new. Uh, we're going to pass in that static strategy method that's generated by the macro, so you don't have to implement that or anything. And at this point, we just populate that node with information. We'll set the ARN, uh, we'll set the launch time, we put it into a graph description concept uh, or construct. Uh, and, and that's it. This is all the code that's necessary. Uh, my opinion is that if you do this once, it'll be really easy to do it a second time. You'll probably run into a couple of things, just not necessarily knowing Rust very well, uh, but it's, it's really quite simple once you know what you're doing. Everything from here is going to be in Python, uh, and it'll be even easier. This is the EC2 instance query. You saw the process query earlier, right? This is how our analyzers are going to start looking for sketchy patterns that have EC2 instances in them. Really, technically, the only thing you have to do is write this code here. It's just a constructor. We're going to inherit from the dynamic node query, and it'll provide all of these interfaces under the hood for us. But 
so that we can provide a kind of prettier API. We'll wrap those internal interfaces with ones that have nicer names, like uh, with launch time or with instance ID. Right? But that is it. This is all the code you need to start building analyzers at this point. So views are what we use in engagements and are what we actually consume from uh, the analyzers when something is updated. So we'll create a, a view construct for this AWS EC2 instance. It's really quite simple. We have a constructor that has to take a couple of values, the dgraph client, which is the graph database that the master graph uses, uh, a node key, a UID, uh, and then just whatever properties uh, our node has. Uh, pretty simple, just construct that um, your, your super class uh, and again, mostly we're going to be adding helper classes, but there are two methods that we have to go uh, and implement here. Pretty simple. Everything is just a mapping of field name to type. So launch time is an integer. Um, ARN is a string. That's it. Uh, because the Python code doesn't know the schema of the graph database, you kind of have to create these mappings for it. Same thing for the edge types. Uh, there are reverse edges denoted by tildes. So AWS EC2 instances have no forward edges, but they do have reverse edges, like all of the guard duty alerts that they are a part of, right? So we say uh, for any finding resource reverse edge, uh, there can be many guard duty alert views because we might be a part of multiple uh, alerts. Uh, and when we, from an EC2 instance perspective, talk about those alerts, uh, we call them guard duty findings, right? So it's sort of the, the mapping of a reverse edge to a forward edge and saying what the type is. Uh, and again, we, we will add these helper methods. So this is all pretty simple. These are all of the constructs that you technically need to implement a plugin in Grapple. Uh, this is still a work in progress. I'm hoping to cut some of this down and provide some more intuitive interfaces, but um, really not much work. I built this guard duty plugin, which included users and, and alerts and all these other things. I think it was less than an hour and I was building the system as I was doing it, so it was, it's pretty, pretty quick. There is only one more piece here, and that's the actual deployment. Technically, you can deploy this however you want as long as it goes into EC2, uh, but Grapple provides a construct to the Amazon Cloud Development Kit, so that's an infrastructure as code a uh, group of libraries and, and things like that. Grapple provides a library in TypeScript. It'll be in Python soon, but Python was not supported when I started building this. Uh, pretty simple, we'll use the event emitter construct. We're gonna create a new event emitter for guard duty logs. So AWS will just ship those off into an S3 bucket and this will set up all the events and notifications. A service construct, uh, that's gonna set up our AWS Lambda, which will actually run the subgraph generator. And we'll set up a, an integration with the output bucket, the place we're going to emit new events to, in this case, the unidentified subgraph bucket. And that's it. You can run uh, deploy, CDK deploy. All of your code is going to go up there. It'll all be managed by AWS. Really nice and easy. Setting up Grapple is uh, intended to be as easy as possible. Uh, if you clone the repo, to the grapple-cdk folder. You can fill out a .env file. Uh, there is one field in that file, and it is a bucket prefix. Just use an org name, anything that's like not uh, going to be taken by somebody else. It just has to be unique. And run the deploy all script, and that's it. It'll take about 15 minutes, uh, but you don't have to sit there and even hit yes. It'll just take its time and set up those resources. At this point, once you've run this script, uh, the lambdas are all set up, the graph database is set up. Uh, everything needed for identification, the S3 buckets, the user interface that we saw earlier for engagements, uh, that's it, right? So about 15 minutes, couple of commands. There is one last thing that has to be done. We're gonna provision the schemas for that graph database so that Grapple knows how to talk to it properly. For this, we can go to our AWS console, uh, select SageMaker. We can just pick the notebook that Grapple has already created for us right down there. At this point, either create a new notebook or you can just use the one that's provided by Grapple. Run this notebook, it's going to provision everything and at this point, you're done. Send up some test data, which is also part of the repo. These are sysmon logs. You can see that dropper.exe and the malicious SVC host. You can investigate those, check out what the uh, network traffic was, right? Dropper.exe pulled that file from somewhere. You can figure out uh, from where. You can look at the, uh, the child processes and see what those are doing and just you know, perform your own investigations. Cool. So I, I believe I should have time for questions because I 
went as quick as I possibly could. Uh, but like I said, Grapple's open source. If you're interested in contributing, interested in using it, feel free to hit me up. Always happy to talk to people about it. Cool. Nice job. A um, couple Thanks. questions. So how do you think about uh, recursive state? Mm -hmm. So for example, if you look at those EC2 instances, network firewall rules might be on, off, on, off, changed. How do you guys think about that? And then second question is two entities, multiple edges, because there can be multiple relationships between them. How do you guys yeah. think about that? Yeah, yeah, those are both really good questions. Um, I would say that by far the hardest things I deal with with Grapple are modeling questions like that they have really big implications for the workflows and that sort of thing. Um, so I'm going to answer your second question first because it's a little easier. Uh, what that comes down to is just a decision. So as an example, right now, Grapple uh, does not have a concept of like writing to a file multiple times. Right? That's going to change by having an intermediary node called like a, a write node, which will store all of the metadata in multiple times for every single write. That's usually the, the abstraction you want. And then the, the query interface can abstract over that uh, very, very easily. It's really just a, a question of whether you want to differentiate those different rights and that sort of thing, um, which has come up a lot of the time with, with Grapple. Uh, connections are another good example. The way connections exist in Grapple is you have a process with an outbound connection, which has an edge to an inbound connection, which has an edge to a process, right? So there's, there's these intermediary nodes that we can hold that information in. Uh, so really just a matter of making that call. As for uh, recursive systems, um, I'm not sure I fully understand exactly what you're asking. Maybe if, if you could clarify, I think I kind of understand the, the IP question. So, so it's not as much about recursive systems. It's about successive state changes. So if you think ah. about uh, something like a firewall rule, typically what right. happens in a vulnerability gets set, gets open, gets closed. That time sequence, it's not clear how that's represented because it's the same state being changed multiple times on the same entity. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a, a really good question. And again, one of the tougher modeling questions that I've run into. Um, state changes are something you, you can abstract away by saying, like, here's a node representing the firewall rule from this time to this time, and another node uh, with this new firewall rule, right? So if you wanted to expose that for something like a firewall rule, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and you could build that into your EC2 plugin. Um, do, you have a, are you, do you have a clarifying? I was just going to say, in both those cases, those somewhat permute the constant time uh, calculation piece, right? Because those grow linearly or exponentially based on the number of connections or stay, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. So let's say your firewall changed like 100 times, right? Then you have to perform 100 edge expansions. The good news is that edge expansions are extremely efficient, uh, and hopefully your firewall isn't changing like millions of times. But yeah, totally, totally reasonable thing there. Um, one thing that I've thought about, the, the nice thing about being in AWS and about being a platform is that we're not constrained to the, the graph database even, right? If I wanted to, I could have a DynamoDB table that just tracks firewall state uh, for everything, and then the analyzer would write to that table and then query the table and say like, okay, summarize this information. Has it changed for this port, right? So in theory, if you wanted to solve that problem, there's, there's nothing stopping you from just setting up a new system. In terms of representing it in the graph, it's a hard call to make. It really depends. For a firewall, I might be inclined to put that into the graph because I don't expect tons and tons of changes. For something else, you know, Graphs are awesome for, for a huge amount of these workloads. I think they're a great like, native fit for most cases. But if something doesn't fit into it, set up another database. Put your data in there. Right? Optimize for the, for the workload you're looking to solve. Yeah. Cool. Hey, uh, thanks for the great talk and, of course, for open sourcing it. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, I don't know to what extent you have used this or deployed this uh, at scale and relied on it. Uh, but sort of the fundamental, basically the Splunk problem that everybody's got is sort of <laughs> the, the volume of logs that you've got to deal with. And uh, it sounds like, to some extent, you, you're getting rid of a bit of the redundancies that you would deal with, with all these like tons of logs revolving around the same thing. Yeah. Do you have a sense of sort of the storage efficiency that you can reach by having sort of everything already identified, codified into this graph database versus holding on to all the logs that you would over a month, two months, three months for an entire fleet? Yeah, yeah, th that's, that's a good question. So um, 
In terms of scalability, it's, it's kind of variable, right? So the logs that I work with at home are going to be Sysmon logs. And Sysmon logs, just in, they have so much redundant information. Um, I have something like uh, 60 megabytes of Sysmon logs that I run tests with. And it, it tears through those in seconds. That's, that's nothing. Um, and the, the actual storage property is about an order of magnitude less than that in terms of the data that Grapple actually has to hold on to. That should scale really well as you add more and more redundant data, but it's going to be super workload dependent, right? So if you have, um, I think the good news is that for the systems that are the worst offenders for something like Splunk, they're actually the best case for Grapple. So uh, an extremely noisy process that's doing tons and tons of things, uh, that's Grapple's best case because very few of those things will actually be unique in terms of logs. Uh, for systems where it's like tons and tons of unique different processes and files executing, it will certainly be no worse than Splunk. Um, it's worst case is linear scaling. So yeah, it's, it's hard to give a, a good metric there because it's so use case dependent. Uh, the system itself has a, a huge factor on it. Uh, the log type has a huge factor on it. So it's, it's hard to really answer that directly. Yeah, but it, it is no worse than Splunk, certainly. And I, I have <laughs> felt those exact pains. <laughs> That's always the, the goal, yeah. <laughs> Anything else? Do you see uh, standardization coming down the pike for like predicate names, types, or like RDF namespaces as this concept gets more popular? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the biggest focus that I have been having over the last couple of months is getting to stability, API stability. That's actually why the plugin system exists, so that I can stabilize the core of Grapple start moving other concepts into separate systems that can stabilize at their own pace. Uh, most of what you saw is entirely stable. Uh, so the query interface for processes should be stable. That's not an API guarantee yet, but I intend it to be very soon. Uh, the common information model that I'm using uh, is standard. It's, it's a, a little bit modified because I have all these edges and stuff like that. But for the most part, those properties are, are absolutely stable. Edge names. It's, it's subject to change at this point. Um, on top of that, I mentioned that I'll probably have these uh, sort of intermediary nodes to handle things like writes. Once that's out of the way, uh, which is probably a matter of weeks, um, I, I will be stabilizing it. And I'll make strict API guarantees. Yeah. But that's, it's a big focus right now. Are we good? <laughs> Another Sorry about the Wi-Fi issues, by the way. <laughs> hey, man, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Urban. Good to meet you. Yeah, you as well. Do I? I, I know you from from the selection committee. That's what I thought. Yeah. Okay. Cool, cool. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's great. I'm really glad to be here. I yeah, was, uh, I don't know how to get this thing off of me. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to break it. Yeah. Yeah. Great job, though. Cool. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. I, um, I was telling Best Dave, I, thank you. Uh, B sides was my first conference uh, when I when I first got into security, and it, it's been really nice to actually come out here and and for one thing provide an open source project, but also to give yeah. a talk and everything. So. Yeah, please do. If you, you run into any problems or you got questions, just hit me up. This is uh, any time after 5 p.m. I'm probably available for this. So. Okay, cool. Sounds good. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, nice to meet you. Yeah, yeah, you as well. I appreciate it. Hey. Good to meet you. Yeah, nice talk. Thank you. As you think about EC2 and overlaying the infrastructure side of things, yeah. Not so terrible, just normal, good email. And I can label these as such, and then I can feed these to my classifier, and they now know my definition for spam and my definition for ham. Cool. So then I can take this other text down here, this other like set of emails, and I can feed it to my classifier. And based on the definitions I've provided, my classifier will assign a label to these emails. right? So it's kind of like if I tell you to draw an apple and I put an apple on the table in front of you or give you a picture of an apple. So I'm telling you both what I want from you, but also giving you an idea of kind of what that should look like. 
So contrast that with unsupervised learning. So this is when we provide input and we just let the model figure it out. Um, we don't define the categories as we did in the spam classifier example, but we let the model do it for us. And a really popular example of this is using an algorithm called k-means to cluster handwritten numeric digits together. So we don't provide any source of truth. We just say, you know, sort all of these into groups that look the most similar to each of the others, if that makes sense. And k-means is actually one of the algorithms we'll be talking about in a moment. Okay, data types. So categorical, these are categories, these are things that don't have numeric properties. And then numeric, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. They are numbers. Um, so before we get into talking more about the results, I wanna talk about imbalanced classes. And so this essentially is when the number of observations or data points in each of your classes or groups is not evenly distributed. This is a really, really important concept if you're wanting to do any sort of anomaly detection or detecting things that don't typically happen a lot of the time. So to kind of explain how this would work with MailChimp, so here's, here's our user base, and these are normal users. The majority of all of our users, these are people who are just marketing their small business, they're creating landing pages for their like community group, whatever, they're doing normal stuff. And then we have these users. So these are the users that we're talking about. These are the ones we're interested in. They're doing bad stuff, uh, they've been attacked, or they're sending malicious uh, content. These are the ones that we really wanna focus on. So if I were to randomly sample this data, and let's say just pull you know, 10,000 users out of the entire MailChimp user base, the likelihood that the distribution of okay versus not so okay users would match this is really high. Like I'm probably gonna get the same distribution in my sample data set. Which is great from a sampling perspective, but it's not so great from uh, the perspective of training our model to recognize these because there aren't enough examples of these if I just sample randomly. So that's something that we're gonna have to address when we get into feeding data to the model. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the models. Um, and I will say, this is, I'm gonna talk through this, this has been a trial and error process, and it's also still in progress. This work isn't finished. Um, so it's not gonna be like a super straight shot of just I did this and I did this and it worked. No, it's a little bit more real than that. So I hope that that's useful. Okay, so first we have to figure out what data we're gonna feed to the model. And there's a lot of options. This is obviously not all of them, but it's just a sample of them. Um, there are tons of different ways I could look at this. And I eventually ended up filtering things down to, to something that looked like this. Um, and you'll notice that these are mostly security related or what I would consider security adjacent features. So I wanna call attention to this specifically because this is where in particular, if you are, you've been in InfoSec for a long time, you've been in the security space for a long time and you wanna do stuff like this, this is where your expertise is so critical. And this is a place where you can really shine, even if you feel like you're not sure about the modeling piece of it, because you already have a sense of what might be important. Like, I chose these features because I thought, I feel like these are going to have some bearing on how users might be grouped, and they might have some bearing on whether a user is deemed more or less risky or at risk of being abused or attacked. And so, I just wanna point that out. Like, domain expertise here is really, really, really important and can save you a lot of time. So yeah, so I start with security only, or security adjacent features, and, uh, Seems like a good place to start. So this is kind of what my data looks like. This is a simplified version, of course, but um, you can see that I have two-factor status represented, and then the two uh, other features that we talked about earlier, uh, times found in breaches, and then the number of logins. And you can see how these accounts differ. One thing I wanna point out here is that these accounts, um, or excuse me, this variable, the two-factor uh, presence or absence, this is a categorical variable. I've encoded it numerically because I want it to work with a model that takes numbers, but uh, these are categories, so just keep that in mind. So I started with k-means. Um, I started here because this was really, like I was just sort of sitting at my desk one day and I was like, 
this would be a cool thing to do. K, okay, k-means is a thing to cluster. Okay, I'm gonna use k-means. That was literally how I selected this to begin with, okay. So, I mean, come on. Like, the, the, one of the cool parts about this type of stuff is that it's all sort of like, try stuff and see what happens. Like, there's experimentation to this, and so that's, that's really fun. Um, this part wasn't so fun, but anyway. Um, so, k-means, essentially, it's, it's a distance-based algorithm, and it, I will point out, it only works with numeric data, so that will be important. But the way it works is just like the geographic segmentation that we talked about earlier. So it basically will take a distance measure of each of the data points. So these will be your cluster centers, the restaurants, and then it will measure the distance from each of those data points to each cluster center, and then assign each of those data points one of those clusters. Cool, okay. So I said that you know, k-means requires numeric data. Well, most of the, um, a lot of the features that I had were categorical in nature, so I had to transform them. And there are a number of ways to do this, but I essentially encoded them each, uh, each of these things as numeric values, because I was like, you know, that seems like that'll work. So I ended up with what essentially looks like a sparse matrix of ones and zeros for these mostly binary categorical features. So k-means uses distances, right? So what could end up happening here is k-means is gonna consider really close two objects that are actually very distant from, distant from one another just because they've been assigned two close numbers. So just because two things have the value of one doesn't mean that they're close. It just means that was the only other option because it's a binary variable. So I stopped right here. I didn't actually go further with this. I was like, no, this is a waste of my time. I'm not gonna do this. But it wasn't really a waste because it kind of made me think more about how this would work. So I was like, okay, I have categorical data. Let me find something that's gonna work with that. Instead of trying to fit my data to this model, wow, that was a weird way to say that. Instead of trying to make my data work with this model, let me try and find a model that will work with this data. So I found k-modes. And k-modes is pretty similar in concept to k-means. Um, but instead of distances, it uses dissimilarities. And so essentially, um, it quantifies the total mismatches between two objects or two data points. And the smaller that number, the more similar the two objects are. The larger, um, the less similar they are. Instead of means, it uses modes. So here's an example of the data that I fed to uh, k-modes. Again, you can see a lot, of, a lot of this is binary categorical. There's a lot of other stuff that's over off the screen that you can't see. Um, and so here's what I ended up with. All right, so after trying a number of different uh, numbers of clusters, trying different ways of doing this, uh, I ended up using eight clusters just for no real reason. Let me be very clear, no real reason. Again, I'm just kind of throwing stuff together and seeing how well it works. And I ended up with this distribution. So each of these here, to orient you, uh, these, are, these numbers over here on the left are the classes, or the clusters. And over here uh, are the counts of users who fall into each of those clusters. So you might think, as I did, oh my gosh, okay, these are the anomalies. It's five and four and seven are the classes. This is what I wanted to find. That was not actually true. Um, it ended up being that there were a couple of accounts that looked really similar, they just had different role-based like access controls, like one was a viewer, one was an author. So that wasn't quite as exciting as I hoped. And then I started reevaluating uh, everything, like all of my choices. And, um, and so I went back to the drawing board and I was like, okay, um, let's add some features. Maybe instead of focusing on security attributes only, Maybe what I need to do, because the whole point of this is to generate kind of a holistic picture of a user and understand all of the attributes that end up, that go into that, whether they're more or less secure. And it's not just security related attributes. It can't be, that just doesn't make sense. And so I ended up adding a couple of other features, uh, things like account size, so like how many email addresses or do they have saved in their account? Um, how much do they pay us? Do they pay us? Uh, and a couple of other things in addition to these um, security features. But then I wound up with both categorical and numeric data. So 
that's a problem because now I've got to find another algorithm. And I actually came across this, I don't want to call it obscure, but there's not a whole lot of stuff out there about it. Uh, I found this algorithm called K-prototypes. And it was introduced, I think, in a 1997 or 98 paper um, that was essentially for this type of problem, not necessarily security related, but clustering with um, mixed data types. And I was like, okay, you know what? This seems like this might work pretty well. And so I have my data. Both, you can see, we've got like a nice mix of different types of attributes. And uh, okay, let's run it through K prototypes. K prototypes, by the way, works kind of, it's the same idea as K means and K modes, uh, but it uses dissimilarity instead of just pure distance. So we now have this. And again, these are the clusters. And these are the counts over here on the right, are the counts of users that fall into those clusters. And so, okay, this looks a little more balanced than the results I got before. But it's still kind of, I'm not really sure what to make of it. So like, I'm curious specifically about clusters one and seven just because they're small and they seem like they're outliers. And so I was just very curious, my, the, like, the security mind in me was like, okay, two-factor authentication. Maybe there's something different about them here. And there was. <laughs> So um, these were the charts that I showed you earlier. And so cluster one and cluster seven, again, just two separate groups of users. And they these, these two clusters had the highest rates of adoption of two-factor authentication across all of those clusters. So there's something. And then these, clusters four and five, were the clusters that had the lowest uh, across the board adoption of two-factor. And cluster four and five, let me just go back for a second. So they're not the largest, but they're somewhat similarly sized, so that's kind of interesting as well. This, this is a really, I'm so sorry for the quality of this. Um, this is really embarrassing. But there is also an extremely, extremely, extremely weak but positive correlation between whether someone um, pays us monthly, so has a non-zero uh, average monthly payment, and whether they have some type of two-factor. You actually can't even see it on the projector because it's so slight, but it's there. So I feel like I'm on the right track. <laughs> okay, but ultimately, these results are still kind of imbalanced. So what am I gonna do? And I, so to be clear, from this randomly sampled data, these, these were 10,000 user accounts. It shook out to be about, I think, 13,000 like, accounts that could log into these accounts. There's a chance that the actual target class wasn't even represented in this data. So there's a couple of ways to deal with this, uh, with the imbalance class issue. So one uh, is taking, so is oversampling. So this would be taking all like normal users and original, or excuse me, and not so normal users, and basically creating copies of this not so normal, like these bad users, and inserting copies into a duplicate data set. So I would have the same or almost the same number of observations of the, the class that I'm really curious about and also just the normal user base. I could also do something where I undersample. So I could just cut this uh, large normal user set and make it equivalent to the, um, the smaller, more interesting target set that I want to look into. I will say that um, I have a little bit of a hunch that this is probably going to work better, that oversampling will probably work better, just because I think giving, my, giving whatever model a chance to see this this much will probably help out a lot as far as uh, giving extra visibility into kind of what these accounts look like and being able to recognize them. Uh, but I'm probably going to try this too just because this whole thing is, you know, in the spirit of just let's randomly try stuff. So I'll probably do that. Um, and then I kind of want to, I've touched on the fact that this isn't finished. <laughs> this is still like the, where I stopped just there is essentially how far I've gotten in this research. So I want to talk about a couple of questions. I presented this um, to the data science folks at my organization a week or so ago. I got some really good questions, and I want to talk about those. So one of the, the big, big questions that I've gotten is, how are you going to evaluate 
the results of this, particularly given that you're using unsupervised learning. This is a really hard problem, just like in any, in general, across any domain, across any problem where you're using unsupervised, or excuse me, using clustering, clustering is unsupervised. Um, but a lot of it really depends on why you're using unsupervised clustering techniques to begin with. I keep saying unsupervised clustering. Clustering is unsupervised. There's not a, really a type that's supervised. Um, so it really depends on why you're using this method in the first place. And unfortunately, most techniques that, uh, d that allow you to evaluate, like formally evaluate the success of a clustering model um, require access to some sort of you know, ground truth, some sort of labeled data. And so that's kind of tough. Um, I could generate some labeled data myself because I, going back to the whole idea of domain expertise, I think I have a good idea of what constitutes a fairly secure versus a not so secure account. But again, that kind of almost defeats the purpose of feeding it to a clustering model to begin with. So I'm not really sure. Um, I think this is probably gonna take some manual review. I think I'll probably have to go through and just look to see, you know, do the clusters make sense? Which doesn't really sound super cool and like advanced, but that's the reality of what I'm probably gonna do. And then another common question I get is, you know, what other models have you considered? So all the models that I talked about here um, are centroid-based clustering. And so I'm probably gonna try dbscan or some sort of density-based clustering model at some point. Um, again, I'm probably gonna throw a bunch of things at the wall and see what sticks, just because I'm really curious how this will shake out. Um, and what I'd really like to do is eventually, long term, put this data uh, into a supervised model. Use this to train a, a supervised classifier. Um, and you know, I'll probably do something like look into a random forest or some other type of ensemble model. So, and I think this is really the crux of this whole thing is what is the point of this and how does this actually fit into the defensive security program at MailChimp? Like how does this fit into what you already have? So ultimately my goal for this is to, at the simplest layer, if you are a high risk account, if we deem you high risk or you're a security risk, maybe we don't let you fail at login so many times. Um, or maybe there are certain things around the perimeter of the account that we don't let you do quite as much as we would an account that we deem um, not so much of a security risk. And that's super broad, I realize that, uh, but part of it's gonna be figuring out what that looks like. But really what I wanna do is provide a heuristic for my team and for our anti-abuse team, and anyone else who touches this type of problem to focus monitoring efforts on accounts that really need it. Because we have, we, have a very, we have millions and millions of users, and it's impossible to catch everything. So if, if I can help carve out these groups, so one of them would be the, like these kind of, um, the accounts that I showed on the left side of the spectrum earlier, if I can help provide attention on those and give a spotlight to those, then I feel like I'm doing something to help my team, and that's really what I wanna do. And no, you know, this isn't perfect at all. Um, this is just one tiny piece of the puzzle that, you know, security is a la defensive security requires a layered approach. And this is just one more layer on top of other things that we are doing, that we will be doing, um, and that I hope will help uh, both my team uh, and other teams get, get to the, the important stuff quicker. So, thanks. And I think we definitely have time for questions, so I am up for, up for that if anyone has any. So you looked at 2FA to see if there was anything special about it. Did you look at the other variables as well to see if there's special things about them or not yet? Yes, so I, didn't, I can't really share all of it, but yes, there are definitely other, other pieces as well. That was just an example. And so, it looks like you're using Jupyter Notebooks, and yes. that's been something that I think several of the speakers today have actually kind of demonstrated. So could you tell us a little bit about how Jupyter Notebooks have facilitated doing this kind of um, analysis for you? Yeah, for sure. In fact, let me go back to one of the screenshots just as an example. 
So Jupyter Notebooks, if you've attended any of the talks in here today, you've probably seen some examples of this. But essentially, it's an interactive Python environment that allows you to break up your code into these neat little cells. And it, provi you, it, pro it provides kind of like a living document. You can reuse it. Um, so I can plug in any type of other data set. Like I could just change what actually, what data this is and still run this analysis again. Um, so it makes it really easy to continue to like hand analyses off. It also has the nice benefit of like I can, I can create notebooks that have these types of visuals in them along with markdown and other types of text annotations so that I can pass this off to my boss and their, like I can pass this off essentially to an executive with, with, with this kind of content in it. So yeah, interactive environment, but also one thing that I really like about it is that it makes it easy to share that kind of stuff. So did looking at either the medians or the prototypes or the means when you did your clustering give any insight as to what the clusters actually meant? Yeah, so unfortunately, um, the, way that, the way they kind of took shape was based on um, account attributes that could be found really evenly spread across different, different which doesn't, I realize that doesn't make sense, I'm not explaining that well. Yes, but it wasn't super helpful for discerning why an account would be in one bucket versus another, if that makes sense. Can, can you talk about security education for the users and, I mean, is there an outcome of the research? Are you retraining users? Are you communicating with them? Changing the variables? Yeah, so this is actually something I've been discussing with some folks very, very recently. Um, we historically have been really careful about reaching out to users or suggesting proactive things, partly because, you know, let's say we decide we want to email everyone who doesn't have two-factor authentication on and be like, hey, lock your stuff up, like, what are you doing? That can also kind of have a different interpretation. People can think, they will see that and go, oh no, the MailChimp sent a security thing. We're really concerned. This looks like it could, they might have been hacked. Oh no. So there's a really, there's a fine line and we're still trying to decide where that line is. We're talking about it though. And I am fighting very much for us to be able to somehow talk to these users, all of these, and say, please do yourself a favor. And turn on these types of security features that we offer. So yeah, it's, it's a really hard, pro I mean, it's, you know, there's the whole like policy versus what we want, so yeah. Uh, first of all, great talk. I love seeing machine learning applied to like data science problems in the security world. And it kind of brought up for me like this question of like, what is the dependent variable in this model? Like, it seems like you have a lot of independent variables about users and not a ton that the model would even be able to pick up on in terms of outcomes. And so maybe just to build on the previous question, like, do you have metadata about the kinds of outcomes you're interested in or is that just not available? Or like, what, what are you hoping to see at the end of this model aside from identifying user accounts that are anomalies? Yeah, so ideally what I would do um, and I didn't really get into this in the talk just because there was a lot to cover. Um, we, we have a known data set of accounts that have been attacked and taken over. I know what those look like. And so those are things that I want to go back and be able to potentially feed to some of the, the future models and say, can you discern whether these are good or bad? One interesting, pro I'm sorry I'm like going on about this, but one interesting problem that we have is when an account is attacked or taken over or abused in some way, Almost immediately, we have a team that reaches out to that user to say, hey, something happened, you need to change your password, you need to turn on two-factor, you need to set up these notifications. And so it's, it's great for the user, but it kind of is unfortunate for this research because what happens is we don't get a picture of what that attacked user looks like at the time of attack. So that's actually an initiative I'm working on with some of our data engineers right now to get those account snapshots so that we'll be able to have that source of, okay, this is what they looked like. So I hope that answers your question. So a follow on to that. Um, Over here. Sorry. Um, no, you're <laughs> good, you're good. Um, so it, it, it seems as though you would have two types of malicious users. So the first type is an account that wasn't malicious mm -hmm. where their account got hacked, taken over, and now is being used for nefarious activity. 
and then you'd have the other type of malicious user account that was set up with the premeditated idea to be to use that account maliciously. Did you find anything from the clustering that would help identify or correlate with the first, uh, those premeditated ones I'd call them? Yes, so this is actually another thing that I am working on kind of in conjunction with this. This is, this is completely different. So the way those accounts look, those accounts that are created to be bad, they're just garbage, they look different. Um, they, there are specific things about them that unfortunately I can't go into here, but there are definitely things about them that may, it, they're, they can be very easy to detect. And so, th so I don't want to say that's an easier problem, but in some ways it can be, because, particularly if it's something automated, if we see bot signups or things like that. Um, we have some methods in place to deal with that. But this is a little bit harder because, or at least it's harder in a, it's hard in a different way. Um, and we haven't really spent a lot of time on this particular piece of it, which is why I'm focusing on that. That's also another really, a really big uh, vector though, for sure. Yeah. So it sounds like this is something that you kind of, you had the idea and then you kind of have learned and evolved your knowledge of it as you've mm -hmm. researched it. Um, what kind of tips would you have for other people that are in their organization and might want to try to apply that kind of, to learn how to apply data science to their own internal problems starting from kind of the same position you were starting at and trying to kind of follow in your footsteps? Yeah, so that's a really good question. So one thing I will say is that I think I've been very lucky because MailChimp encourages a culture of experimentation and so if I do all of this and it turns out to be, you know, we can't really use this in production, we can't really do anything with this, that's still okay because we've learned something. So I will say, I will put that out as like as a caveat, but I would say, you know, think about your user base or think about, you know, what questions keep you up at night? And is there a way to somehow start thinking analytically about this? And I realize it's a lot easier said than done, but thinking through the lens of an analyst or a data scientist. What types of data do you have available? What can you query easily? What can you get through? Get your hands on data. Get, even if it's, I mean, if it's in a Google Sheet, if it's in a spreadsheet, it doesn't matter. Start getting familiar with it. Um, because the only reason I knew to go to some of these things was because I, I lived in an analyst role for so long. I knew what, what the user account landscape looked like. So I would say get really familiar with that. Um, and then just start playing with things, like start getting your hands dirty, like don't be afraid. Like that, so much of this failed, but I learned a lot from it, so. I'm sorry, but I don't know if um, this is covered earlier before I was able to get in, but um, if I, did you have, did you, when you're doing this work, did you discover that there was a gap in data so you had to go back and add new data sources in order to be able to get it, the correct sort of information? Yes, sorry, I wasn't sure if you had a second part to your question. Um, yes, absolutely. So one of those situations was in going through the different models, realizing that I needed not just account security related data, I needed just normal, what does your account look like? How much do you pay us? How, much, uh, how many users do you have? Like other types of just account attributes. But what, there's one piece, so I touched on this just a minute or two ago. Um, we don't have data around what an account looks like at the time of attack. And that's, that, so those, those uh, values aren't, st they're not time stamped and stored, essentially. Um, when the user turns on two-factor, that gets updated, but we don't necessarily like timestamp that and say this is the history, this is the change log of when a user enabled these things. And so that's something that I'm working on like right now uh, with our data team to get that to get that in because that, that's been huge. That's actually created a whole lot of extra work for this because that's something that I don't have that source of truth. So does that answer your question? Okay.
Thank you all so much. I appreciate it. I'm going to give you an assist with this. Thank you so much. Uh, I see. You got I stuck see. on my zipper. Yep. 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 And then, uh, oh, there we go. Thank right. you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. small do you mean? Um, like a couple thousand or? Um, yeah, I'd say maybe a thousand, two thousand. Is there any way you can, so when I talked about like the oversampling, like this kind of situation, is there any way maybe you could create copies of the, the classes that you're interested in and maybe do something like that? That's kind of hacky, but that's the first thing that comes to my mind. I might try something like that. So, yeah. Good luck. Good luck, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, to kind of a, a general understanding, what I took away from that answer uh, was that we really need to create a stream of account changes, like yes. when a Kafka events says yes. it's yes. not dead. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yes, we do. <laughs> okay, so then the next question is, is there uh, other than the obvious ones that I can look at my data and figure mm -hmm. out, but uh, is there, were there any unobvious things that can be, did like, for example, and here's an unobvious example, mm -hmm. uh, time zone kind of thing, right? Yep. Okay, so like, oh, I didn't realize time zone would be a significant state of the capture mm -hmm. kind of thing. But do you have any examples of like, unobvious stuff that Test one. Test one. So uh, I, I still need a higher. Test one. There we go. Don't feel comfortable talking about them just because they are kind of integral to, to some of this. Um, but there are definitely attributes to the account. So like once I kind of zoomed out, instead of just looking at security related features and zoomed out, I will say there are definitely account attributes that end up having, I think, a little more bearing on that. Then, so to your example, time zone. Um, like I said, I can't go into it a whole lot more than that, and I'm sorry, I wish I could. Um, but yes. How much else have I to buy for you? I don't know, that's a dangerous question. <laughs> so, uh, if you don't remember, did you bring security? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> What's that? Sorry, say that one more time. Has so I don't recall off the top of my head. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I feel like that's definitely where we are. Like I've kind of been able to say, hey, this is important. I think we should try this. And I've, got, I've, I've been loud enough about it that, oh, I think I need to get out of the way. Um, I've been loud enough about it that I think people have been like, well, we either need to take her seriously or placate her so she'll shut up. So that's kind of where that's, where that's gone. Um, I think a lot of it is dependent on organization, though. like so much of it is. Um, and, you know, and whether this ever sees the light of production, I don't know. This is still literally just, you know, in a Jupyter notebook in Git. So. Yeah. So I've seen a ton of people do it uh, internally, and that's kind of why I was interested in looking at it specifically user facing, just because that was such a big, a big problem we have. Um, but I. What's up? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. That was my question about, like, what are your expectations? No, I totally I get it. We have to we have to be careful because people will. Sorry, I interrupted her. No, no, you're you're good. You're 
Thank you. I'm doing a dashboard in Splunk. Look, we've actually, we've got a system in Splunk. Yeah. That we're aggregating risk events. Okay. I've got a, a multi-axis grading system. You've added the ways to explore. This is going to go in with that.
Hi, my name is Gabriel Bassett. My voice is my passport. Verify me. Please welcome John Seymour. Awesome. Cool, cool. Can everybody hear me? Awesome. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to my talk, Reducing Inactionable Alerts via Policy Layer. My name is John Seymour, AKA Delta Zero. And I'm a lead data scientist at Salesforce, where I work on the detection and response team, performing machine learning on security logs to alert to new attacks, to improve our existing alerts and rules, and to find and make new contextual data for use in investigations. My goal here today is to inspire you to be creative in where you apply data science and machine learning techniques. A major impact can be had with very small amounts of effort. If you come out of here with a nagging feeling that machine learning would help you with somewhere it's not normally applied, then I'd call this talk a success. Right, so like a lot of good presentations, let's start with definitions. Oftentimes, humans analyzing model-generated alerts will throw an alert away immediately, right? And we found, as we've deployed our models, there are two main reasons what we've seen how this happens. First, when there are issues with the data pipeline. So these are things like when necessary logs are missing, when parsers fail, when joins between host and network artifacts behave unexpectedly, when third-party information is bad or corrupted, when deployment inconsistencies throughout the fleet, when added contextual information like host names is wrong, when added contextual information is stale, where it used to be right when it's wrong, when added contextual information is right in an unexpectedly way. Um, this list goes on and on and on, right? Contrast this to like obvious false positives where we mean the model is not able to capture the complexity of the instance, where the activity can easily be determined to be a low priority or a non-existent threat to the business, such as a model alerting on beaconing to a company-owned resource. Generally, we've seen these handled after the fact. A whitelist is added which says simply, even if the rule or the model says this is bad, don't alert on it. You can think of whitelists as a simplistic example of a policy layer which addresses the two causes for inactionable alerts. In this talk, we'll demonstrate how even simple modeling improves upon whitelists, and further we'll argue how modeling whitelists separately from modeling suspicious events is actually a natural approach to the problem. So here are some reasonable examples for whitelisting we've seen in the past, right? Uh, for a large number of alerts generated, we don't actually care about if a connection is completely internal to the network. So for these, it might actually make sense to whitelist anything that where the, both the source and the destination are internal. Or we might only care about a connection attack that's successful, right? Um, so we might think filtering alerts where the connection was ultimately unsuccessful, like maybe the firewall blocked the connection, uh, we might think that's a good idea. Or, or another widespread use for whitelists is in filtering if the domain is obviously benign. So like take the top you know, popular white uh, domains and just shove that as a whitelist and say don't alert on any of these things, right? And these are obviously common and widespread ideas, but whitelists create some unintended side effects down the road. They're extremely rigid. If a whitelisting rule matches an event, then the event is just completely discarded, even if the activity is extremely suspicious for other reasons. Um, they're also um, challenging to maintain, right? If you've worked with whitelists, you've probably noticed issues with updating them, you know, since each problem set tends to have different whitelisting requirements. 
For example, take an extremely loud attacker moving laterally through a network. You can't whitelist internal connections for that. Or take failed connections. They could be NX domains today, um, but future command and control instances where the malware just hasn't activated yet. Large number of these might also you know, indicate an infected host or something like that. And benign domains. A major way to exfiltrate information is through standard services that are likely whitelisted. Not even considering the fact that domains are static and most popular domains, or out of popular domains, not all of them are always benign. So I bet that most of you in the room are thinking, okay, we'll just include those as features in our models. And that's definitely a reasonable position to take. But here are some reasons why you might actually want a separate policy layer, at least at first. Let's start easy. Whitelists are already accepted by human analysts and stating this alert has whitelistable characteristics, but we think it's suspicious even given those, is actually still generally well received and you know, useful information to the analyst. However, model-centric reasons exist for such a separation, too. Google Rules of Machine Learning ex uh, advocates for separating spam, filtering, and quality ranking in a policy layer, and that a quality ranking should focus on ranking content that's actually posted in good faith. The main idea behind that rule is that spammers, the adversaries in that context, will attempt to emulate high-quality posts. So features used to indicate you know, high-quality posts today might actually be indicative of spam tomorrow. That concept of adversarial drift also applies here. And the independence of the two types of models actually really helps with tuning training frequency. We all know that adversaries adapt. They're likely to adapt faster than what makes a model or an alert inactionable. Also, separation gives us generalizability, which allows for centralization, reducing code duplication. Most of these features will be present in a large number of rules and mo uh, models um, that you use. So even if most models exclude some of these you know, heuristics, um, you can still have one whitelist model which applies to a large number of rules or models. Um, another is uh, good data is actually the limiting factor for model quality in the intrusion detection space a lot of the time. Separating actually reduces the problem space so that models don't have to learn both what's a good you know, alert, what's likely to be thrown away, and what's actually suspicious at the same time. And that actually means you can label you know, um, data for different tasks and, and be a lot more effective with your labeling. And then finally, some of our team's models have multiple consumers with contradicting preferences. These might actually be unsatisfiable uh, if you try to push them into the de detection model. So how do we actually enforce the heuristics commonly used to filter false positives in a better way? Well, here's a simple machine learning based approach that we've deployed at scale for doing so. Uh, we actually combine you know, these heuristics using a function which penalizes alerts where any such issues are found without completely filtering the behavior. Concretely, if we let X be a list of binary heuristics which are commonly used to filter you know, false positives, then let your policy score be some number between zero and one raised to the count of how many of these heuristics are true for a given event. For example, if lambda is 0.5 and you have two issues surrounding the data, uh, then your policy score would be 0.25, or if no issues are detected, your policy score would be one. And we just reweight the alert by this value. Right, so this is a really, really simple approach, and it's also simple to integrate with the models. Um, actually, integrating this score with rules and models is very straightforward. You just multiply the two different scores together. Um, it also has a lot of other benefits, though. The model can be reused for many use cases. So even in instances where the heuristics conflict with the actual model generated, such as that XFIL detection model um, being using good domains, um, you can actually uh, just reweight the final alerting threshold for the combined score. Um, another uh, benefit is the model is completely unsupervised, requiring you know, zero effort to train. And the model requires very little data science background to actually understand, right? But perhaps most importantly, it allows you to aggregate all of your different heuristics in one place, which makes it much, much easier to maintain. But we know there's no free lunch when it comes to these sorts of things. So what do we actually lose when we're moving to this sort of model for whitelisting? Well, to start, the main change is that we're now allowing a small number of events through that we wouldn't previously. 
So there is definitely, by definition, going to be a non-zero number of false positives. We've mitigated this quite a bit through thresholding, but obviously some of the new alerts that you get are going to be true positives and some are going to be false positives. Um, a piece of low-hanging fruit that you might uh, think is that the model is actually very, very simplistic right now, right? Um, you could, for example, train it on historical data, like previous uh, case adjudications. Um, that's definitely something we're looking into. But probably the primary drawback here is how the model handles repeated alerts. With whitelisting, you can completely negate an alert from being generated, but you can't do that here. You can reduce them by adding sort of features based on prior case adjudications, but that makes the model complex. Um, you could also eliminate them by you know, adding additional, hopefully temporary whitelists, but that brings us back to the initial whitelisting problem and it reduces a lot of the impact of this approach. But uh, here are the main issues that we're trying to improve upon this. Um, first, again, the most obvious being supervised learning, um, which would allow us to more finely tune that you know, policy layer. Um, after that, we plan to try out different stacking methods, so using like, the output of the policy model uh, as a feature when training the, the suspiciousness model and trying different configurations for that. And then finally, we're trying to more formally incorporate the consumer preferences like we stated earlier such as uh, different outputs for threat intel versus uh, our SOC, or for the different responders for risks, vulnerabilities, and policy violations. So that's actually all I had. Um, does anybody have any questions? Hi, uh, thank you. A uh, quick question for you. One of the big problems that I've experienced in the past with trying to kind of work with ML systems in general is the problem of intros of uh, introspectability. Um, and for, you know, coming from an ops background and having been the person getting woken up at like three in the morning, nothing is worse than having something like sometimes tell you one thing and sometimes tell you another thing and like you can't figure out what the hell's going on. Yeah. Uh, how do you kind of, how have you dealt with while working with your customers like dealing with that kind of problem of not necessarily being able to introspect the system in a easy to understand way? Yeah, um, that's definitely a great question. Um, so for the actual uh, whitelisting technique here, um, it's actually very easy to introspect, right? Because um, you actually have the values of the different variables. You know how many are set to one, you know, et cetera. You can just return those to the ops people. Um, Adding in something like a, a supervised method or something like that, yeah, that would definitely obfuscate, for example, um, and, and would harm the introspectability, right? Um, so uh, for this, um, like, we have issues, for example, um, with our, our host name mapping, for example, IP host name mapping. And um, for those, we actually encode that into our, our policy layer by saying, okay, like, uh, this is a known to be faulty, you know, IP hostname mapper, right? Um, and, and we can surface those to whoever's investigating the alert. Cool. Oh, yes. Hi. Uh, so to someone who is completely um, unaccustomed to ML in general, how would you, what strategy would you say is best for determining a proper lambda and how would you really tune that appropriately? Okay, so um, we'd probably do it the same way we actually did it, which is start at just lambda equal 0.5. Um, so that means like, you know, for every uh, extra alert that you generate, then you, you half basically the score, right? The output score. Um, if you wanted to tune it further, you'd probably need actually to get data and collect data about how, um, how many alerts are good and how many are bad coming out of your system. And that's when you want to actually move to something like a supervised approach anyways to sort of tune sort of that lambda. Um, you could also have, say, a different weight for every single feature if you did that technique, um, whereas here we only have a single lambda for efficiency. Cool. Sort of related to that, did you, as maybe a middle ground, look at talking to the analysts and seeing what they thought about the different alert types and assigning different weights based on their feedback? 
Yes, yeah, so um, we actually, we did, so we did definitely talk to the analysts and we did consider assigning different weights to each, uh, you know, different heuristic that's being true. Um, the only issue with assigning weights here is um, basically that sort of explodes the dimensionality of the problem, right? Like you have a different weight for every feature, right? Whereas right now we only have one sort of parameter we're tweaking. Um, and so we decided that basically if, if we did sort of attempt that route, we would wait until we actually had a collection of data that we could use to sort of label things as being, you know, well generated or not, and then just go a supervised approach anyways. So just to make sure I'm understanding right, each feature is a, uh, or each element in a whitelist is going to be a feature in the policy layer? Uh, sort of, so for example, if we have a, like a rule that says it's, in, it's a domain that's in a whitelist, or we have a rule that says, okay, um, the IP, the host name is missing from this particular log, or we're missing the parent log, or things like that, those are all rules that we would use as separate features in that. Uh, okay. that. So ha do you have any thoughts on how to handle the model expanding as you come up with new heuristics you know, yep. over time? Yeah, so that uh, also comes back to the, the sort of supervised training approach. Um, if, if you start something simple like this, like really simple, then you can sort of get a lot of those um, ideas out um, and, and know sort of all the, a, a lot of the different rules that you have. Um, even so, I guess you're probably going after the idea that like, even if you deploy a model today, then later down the road, you're gonna discover something, some new inactionable alert uh, rule or something. No. Oh, okay, well I was gonna say like, we're, we're kind of assuming here that the, the drift in terms of what makes a, an alert inactionable changes much, much more slowly than the suspiciousness sort of score. So adversaries adapt, but your system <laughs> doesn't adapt that fast. Cool. All right, we have no more questions. Let's give another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Assumed a new identity. one I used over in the, uh, one over there was working. Uh, that one? Uh, Tom. Let's see what we got. All right, testing, testing. Yep. Okay, cool.
Okay, just in case anybody's wondering too. Or I could just go over there and just, just do that with you guys then. I mean, I could move the head with some of you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you. 
And if you have any questions, uh, we ask that you use the audience mic so that our YouTube audience can hear you. If you have a question, just raise your hand and I'll be sure to bring over the microphone for you. And lastly, if you have any comments or feedback about this talk or the speaker, there is a survey attached in the shed entry for this talk. And with that, uh, let's begin. Uh, please welcome Rob Brand. All right, so last talk of the day. That means I get to go till, uh, no, eight, nine, ten, but you know, whatever. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, say a quick overview of what I'm going to be talking about. So as I said, my name's Rob Brandon. Been working in the field for 20 plus years, largely in uh, incident response and malware analysis. But I did my PhD with uh, the University of Maryland in uh, machine learning and deep learning applied to uh, security problems. Currently work for the uh, threat hunting team with Booz Allen Hamilton, Dark Labs. And semantic representations of machine code are really my jam. So kind of the, the thing, why, why even mess with this whole embedding thing? A lot of malware analysis and reverse engineering problems are basically similarity questions. You know, as a uh, instant responder or network defender, when somebody gives me a new binary and says like, hey, we think this was used in an attack, it'll usually take me about 20 seconds to say, okay, yep, this is definitely malware. So the really interesting question to me is always, not so much is this malware, it's gonna be, okay, what, how does this work? You know, is it ransomware? Is this some kind of remote access Trojan? And similarly, you've got the uh, vulnerability discovery problem. You know, I've got this new binary, are there any uh, vulnerable code paths in here? So one of the things I'm gonna really care about there is, does it import libraries from other things? You know, does it have code that has vulnerabilities that we already know how to exploit. So once again, it's a similarity problem. A lot of the methods we have out there for measuring code similarity, things like bin diff, graph, co graph comparisons, those really don't scale to n, n, n number of binaries. You know, doing an n by n graph comparison is really not computationally feasible. And similarly, things like a SD hash and SSD work for some things, but you know, they don't really encode any semantic similarity data that you really want for doing these kind of tasks. So this is where we move to embeddings. What embeddings are, these are inspired by the concept of word embeddings in natural language processing, where you take your information, you know, whether it's word, paragraphs, or whatever, and you move it into some kind of high dimensional space where similar things are located similar to each other. So in this case, what we're do, the, the goal here is to take a function out of, exec uh, out of an executable binary and somehow learn a high dimensional representation of it so that functions that do similar things are located right next to each other in the space. And that allows us to do things like say we've got five million functions and we wanna figure out which of, those th th which of the uh, functions in our new binary are similar, similar to those, we can use some kind of locality based search rather than having to do a linear search through the entire database that we have. And another interesting thing with this particular type of technique is a lot of problems in the machine learning space aren't really so much machine learning as they are representation learning. You know, the real challenge is to figure out how can you come, come up with some representation of your data that you can then throw a linear regression on top of to get the answer. So when we look at function embeddings, there are kind of a, a couple of broad ways that we can look at classifying them. So one of the ways I've started, I've started to look at a function embeddings is to look at how much feature engineering is required to build the function embedding. So we have some, some methods, like, such as the one that uh, I created when I was in grad school, which require no feature, no feature engineering. You know, they just take the raw data to generate your embedding. There are a few others that have uh, come out over the last year that other people have uh, come up with that use some more sophisticated domain knowledge in pre-processing the embeddings. And this is really kind of a really new area of research. Like I said, I finished my PhD in, or in 2017 in this area. And since, since then, you know, just really over the past year, there have been other people that have come up with, kind of independently come up with the idea and come up with their own method to uh, 
build embeddings. So really there hasn't been any kind of comparison as to you know, what kind of things are these embeddings learning? You know, what, what methods should we be using to create code embeddings? So this is just a few of the uh, methodologies that have come out over the past year or two. The generative RNNs is a method that uh, I came up with. And so I presented this at a DEF CON AI village last year. This particular method works off of just raw bytes. You know, you don't need to disassemble the function. You don't need to do any kind of analysis of the function. When I was doing my initial work, I did do some normalization to take, say, uh, API calls and normalize those out from being a uh, sequence of bytes into some kind of hash. But the initial experiments I, I was working with show that there's no noticeable improvement. So I just left that particular technique out of here. So basically what you do for these kind of embeddings are you take something called a character RNN, which attempts to generate new information based off of previous information it's seen. So kind of like what's shown in the uh, diagram over there, you take your function, you show it to the network one byte at a time, and af after each byte the network tries to predict what the next byte it's going to see is. You give it feedback at the end of each training cycle, you know, based off what it, what it got right and got wrong. And at the, at the end, you kind of have a uh, network that has created its own internal representation of the particular machine code that it's been trained on. So kind of what you do with these embeddings are you take your train network, you show it a sequence of bytes from the function, and at the end of that sequence, you just take the state of the network, and that's your embedding. So, you know, kind of the embedding is basically what does the, uh, or what, what information did the network find useful in order to predict each byte in that function. So worm to vec is a uh, slightly more complicated uh, function or uh, embedding method that was presented by Abe and Bruce at Camless last year. And what he's doing here is he's extending the word to vec algorithm, which is largely used for natural language processing, and he's extending it to executable code. And now my, per my particular interpretation of this is largely based off of a couple conversations with him and uh, his slides. So there may be some subtle differences in the way I implemented versus the way he did, but I think I'm largely uh, faithful to the methodology. So basically, any, any issues with it are definitely my fault, not his. But uh, so as you can see, this is an example of some assembly code that's been normalized into the modeling format that he's doing. You know, registers are replaced from EBX, EDX, RAX, whatever, into just a token indicating that this is a register. You know, same way, same way with uh, memory accesses and uh, dereferences. Those are just replaced with, you know, this is a memory address, this is a dereference. One of the differences or challenges in, with this type of model is that this requires disassembling the code. Many people working in the disassembly space will tell you this disassembly is still a far from solved problem. So as I'll, as I'll show later, there, having to do that does lead to some potential issues when you're, do, when you're doing this kind of work. And this falls into what I would call like a moderate level of feature engineering. You know, you need to do some disassembly, maybe replace a couple of tokens, but you aren't doing any significant code analysis. You know, you're not trying to compute the call graph or anything like that. So the next uh, method I'm going to discuss is called SAFE, self-attentive function embeddings, uh, created by Luca Massarelli and another group. I believe they were based out of Italy. Uh, this is a little more complicated model than the previous two. But in a lot of ways, it's kind of more sophisticated version of worm to vec And you can get the modeling code for this particular methodology at, the, at their GitHub site. But basically, the way this model works is they uh, so the previous model, worm to vec you basically do word to vec on each of the, each of the instructions, and then you, t you take all the, all the vectors for, an in for a function that were computed by, for each of the instructions, then you just add them together. And basically, the uh, concatenation of all of them gives you your vector. The difference between that and SAFE, SAFE also takes each of the disassembled instructions. They have a slightly more complicated tokenization scheme where they're looking at what memory ranges was each uh, act memory access in and doing some other slightly more complicated stuff, but largely a very similar thing. And they're then, you, they're, they're as, then as well using word to vec to compute a embedding for each instruction. 
But then they're feed feeding the sequence of instructions into a self-attentive um, recurrent neural network in order to compute the final embedding. So very similar to uh, worm to vec but a little more sophisticated. And this falls into you know, what I would consider slightly more significant feature engineering. And finally, there's ASM to, ASM to VEC, which was presented uh, last year at the Jailbreak Security Summit by Sophia D'Antoine. And this is probably the most complex embedding methodology that I've seen anybody attempt to use to date. She included a lot of compositional feature, or a lot of features besides just the compositional bytes of the function, such as its neighbors in the control flow graph, and a lot of other very computationally intensive and very domain specific things into the embedding method that she was doing. Unfortunately, the code for this was not publicly available, and I wasn't able to figure out how to recreate it just from the data that's out there, so I wasn't able to include that in this particular experiment. So finally, kind of to the, the data set I was using, I really wanted to find a data set where you had some very easy to define classes that were gonna be present in the data set, but I also wanted some code that was going to have some relation over time. So kind of a natural fit for this for me was the uh, code base of the various BSD Unixes. So if you look kind of at the history of things, in 1992 you had 386 BSD. You know, year, year or so later that got forked into NetBSD and FreeBSD. Then you know, back in 95, NetBSD got forked into OpenBSD. So we have this, this code base that had a similar start, you know, a similar origin you know, 20, 20 years ago or so, but that has evolved significantly in the years since. So do, trying to come up with some kind of you know, code similarity analysis, this looked like a really interesting corpus of uh, code to take a look at. So what I ended up getting out of this data set was 222 binaries. Each one of the binaries was present in either bin or user bin across all three operating systems. So you know your LS, your SH, what, whatever other uh, binaries had a common name. The FreeBSD binaries I compiled with dash O0 and dash O2. Uh, NetBSD and OpenBSD, I unfortunately was not able to get the make.conf files to work for changing the optimization flags from the default. And after a couple of days of banging my head on that, I just kind of gave up. I additionally, I only used functions that were greater than 16 bytes because I really didn't want to have a, just a bunch of thunks in there that were, you know, of course, those are all going to be the exact same code and that's gonna throw off a lot of similarity metrics. So basically the criteria was only functions that are greater than 16 bytes and less than 2048 bytes were used mainly because anything over 2048 bytes is really just an outlier size-wise, and to keep it easy, I wanted to uh, have some boundary there. Uh, the initial parsing of all the functions was done with Binary Ninja. So I used Binary Ninja to, to determine where the function boundaries were, and all of these were compiled with debug symbols, so it was, you know, didn't have to do any uh, significant work, and there wasn't the problem of where do you de how do you determine where a function begins and end, ends. So binary ninja was used to extract the binary code and the disassembly for all of the code, except for the safe model. So one of the things I really wanted to try out here was the, uh, the safe group, they trained the model that they released on a selection of 64 binaries from Linux. So, so several user space library binaries from Linux. So the interesting thing here is can you, really, can you just release a model trained on one set of uh, code that generates embeddings and still have that, those embeddings be comparable to embeddings that are trained using other code? And I got some really, really interesting results with that, as I'll show you in a few slides. But the other problem was SAFE uses Radar 2 to embed or to disassemble the code that it feeds into their model. Unfortunately, Radar 2 is not always the most reliable binary analysis system, so it broke on the best of trying to decompose the majority of the functions that were found. So the final data set out of those 49,000 functions ended up with about 19,000 functions that went into the model. 
So, so some of the parameters used to train the model, worm to vec, I trained the, that model for 40 epochs. The uh, RNN model trained for 20 epochs. At that point, it had looked like it had largely uh, stopped changing in perplexity. Safe model, I didn't train the new model simply because I wanted to see how well that generalized. And yes, I know that this is definitely a, an experiment where I'm throwing a lot of different things out there. And if I had, you know, o over the next few years, there's definitely a lot of uh, interesting things to follow up and maybe get a little more rigor. But this is still, like I said, I still, still got some uh, really interesting results out of this. And all the models used a dimensionality of 100. You know, whenever you're doing, comparing any kind of embedding type of problem, you really want to make sure you use a constant dimensionality because different dimensionalities are going to have different capacities for encoding data. So you really don't want to uh, you know, say, okay, we're going to trust this one with 10 dimensions and this one with 1,000, because obviously the 1,000 dimensions can hold a lot more data than 10. The other thing is each, each uh, data set used a different binary. So FreeBSD compiled with Clang 7.0.1. OpenBSD was built with Clang 6.0.1. And NetBSD was compiled with GCC 5.5.0. So as far as the class breakdown, FreeBSD-0 had significantly more functions, or was a significantly larger part of the data set. I think it's still not large enough to, for, their, really, for any data set imbalances to really cause issues, especially since most of the issues here are more with uh, model generation rather than with classification. Another interesting thing, kind of as a side note, is that you know, FreeBSD02, the, both FreeBSDs came from the same source code. So there's obvious a lot, obviously a lot of uh, function inlining and uh, other optimizations going on between dash O and dash O2, which is something to keep in mind when you're looking at trying to take two binaries and determine did they come from a similar code base. So one of the things I like to do whenever I'm doing any kind of unsupervised or cluster analysis is throw up kind of a cluster plot of the data that I'm looking at. So in this case, these are just basic scatter plots of the data set for each of the models. And just kind of looking at it off the bat, you can see there's some really interesting things in the, just in the data from, from right here. You know, you notice the uh, safe plot, the uh, classes are a lot more intermixed when projected down to two dimensions via T-SNE than the other two. You know, you get kind of the, the cleanest separation within the RNN model. And you know, the worm to vec is kind of similar to the uh, safe model. In, in, in a lot of cases, you really don't get much more than some intuitive ideas of what kind of space you, class separation you might have in the data and some pretty pictures for a presentation. But I've, I've still found this to be a fairly useful technique. So kind of one of the main uh, method I've come up with over the past couple of years for determining whether two embedding methods work as well is heavily inspired by natural language processing. So one of the main embedding or main ways of testing natural language embeddings are to take your embedding and see how well it works for determining what words are synonyms. So if you look at English and other languages, we've got l plenty of lists out there that says, you know, loves, likes, appreciates. Those are all s similar words. You know, they're all synonyms for each other. So they should so show up in similar parts of the vector space. So with, with binary code, we really don't have that common knowledge, that common ground truth consistency of, well, we know that we should say, when we see these two functions, we should say that they're similar. And that's where I came up with the, uh, concept of a consistency. So basically, all that consistency means is that <clears throat> hard consistency is that if I take function f from set A and I take that same func function with embedding method B, those two out of the entire data set, those two should be the nearest neighbor for each other. So it's basically saying that you know, embedding, you know, if, if I embed a function in safe, hard consistency with worm to vec would be that same fun function has the same nearest neighbor in, word to, or in worm to vec as it does in safe. 
So soft consistency just means that the uh, nearest neighbor from, say, function f in safe is within the 10 nearest neighbors or you know, the n nearest neighbors of the same function in worm to vec for some value of n. And actually, I got some really good numbers on that. So you'll notice the, so the consistency between the RNN methodology and worm to vec was basically non-existent. You know, it's basically was a, showed that there is no consistency there. But there was a very remarkable amount of consistency between the worm to vec method and the safe method. You know, to the order of 43% uh, of the functions ha had hard consistency. And then even with 10, which is obviously kind of a small number for, and for the soft consistency, that still brought it up to about 68% consistent functions from one data set to another. So kind of the takeaway from here is that at least for this, for this experiment, models that had similar feature engineering ended up having similar levels of consistency with each other. And that, I, th I thought that was very interesting because, you know, simply adding a few vectors together is very different than creating a uh, self-attentive network over the same set of uh, vectors. So, you know, kind of the, the simpler, mo the very simpler model with the, same, with the same featurization ended up learning the same stuff as the more complicated model. And one of the things I'm interested in trying later is uh, upping the value of n in this experiment to see just how far that increases the consistency. You know, maybe try with an n of 100 or, you know, 20 and see how that changes things. So, like I said, the uh, data sets that trained on the same stuff are tend to be consistent. Data sets trained on different models tend to be consistently inconsistent. The additional test I did, which was so common in natural languages, given a supervised learning task, how well does the embedding work? In this case, I, most of the times that I've tried this on code embeddings, it's been kind of a waste of time because all of the supervised data we have ends up being trivially easy to model in pretty much every vector. So in this case, trying to determine, you know, the, the supervised learning task was which data set did it come from? Is it a FreeBSD? Is it an OpenBSD? Is it an NetBSD? Every single embedding methodology got 99 point something percent on that. So in order to really exercise code embeddings, we need to try and come up with some more challenging tasks and data sets to maybe get some more useful comparisons. Because ever, saying everything works great isn't you know, necessarily the most useful thing to say. So kind of some of the conclusions and takeaways from this is uh, tooling can definitely make things complicated. The reliance of safe on Rodeo definitely makes that particular methodology hard to just take off the shelf and put into use without doing some significant engineering to say maybe put a different disassembler on the front. So another thing was, you know, even if consistency between models is poor, that doesn't mean that the embedding method is not going to work for your particular use case. You know, as we saw, even though the two different embedding feature, feature sets learn different things, you know, they still worked equally well for what we needed to use them for in the, at the end of the day. And so getting kind of where, up to where things were going with uh, ASM to VEC, features besides the compositional features of code are definitely somewhere that's ripe for research. You know, there's a lot of really interesting things that we could be doing, say, with uh, trying to incorporate the control flow graph and other features from the binary into the model. So one, one of the things I think would be interesting to do from this in the future, most of the work so far has, you know, people have naturally looked at functions as being the best way to, or the best, you know, kind of semantic block of code to measure things in. So we, you know, humans tend to look at things in terms of functions. But looking at things on the, from the computer side, maybe looking at basic blocks would be easier. 
you know, and a basic block is just a section of code where you don't have any control flow changes. So that sidesteps a lot of the problems you have when you're doing program analysis, you know, as far as t determining, you know, have we, ended another, have we ended the function or did we just jump somewhere else due to something else? You know, or, or is this just a piece of code that just has nothing but jumps in order to get around function analysis? So basic block embeddings, There is definitely a really interesting area that I plan on taking this in the future. So other than that, there's my Twitter and email. Uh, anybody have any questions? Thanks. Awesome talk. This whole area is very much my jam, so I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, so I'm, having said that, I'm now going to hit you with kind of a, a sneaky question. Um, one of the things that's come up in looking at embeddings for natural language models is this question of bias. So I think w most of us are familiar at this point with the notion that if you translate from Hungarian that doesn't have gendered pronouns, um, you get different gendered pronouns in English for nurse versus doctor. So to what extent do you think, based on sort of your experience with this, that that might be an issue going forward? Because obviously a lot of the code bases that we have available to us, be it from you know malware aggregation sites or large code bases or stuff like this, these are all skewed from sort of normal behavior. So if you get into actually using this for like reverse engineering, um, at that point, the quality of those embeddings and whether or not it's actually mapping to the right functionality might be biased by that data and, and might, might lead you sort of down the wrong path. So do you have any thoughts on that or how it might be yeah. possible to correct no, so, for so it? I, so I think that's definitely a very heavy potential area, but I think one of the key differences that we can leverage in terms of code as opposed to natural language is that Ultimately, we're not really looking at what's the semantic intent. We're looking at what did the compiler generate. So that's, where I th that's one of the reasons that I think moving towards a uh, basic block approach where we're looking at how, we, how do we combine basic blocks, blocks and then derive meaning from those can potentially help a lot of the issues with uh, the data set bias because a, I mean, a compiler is only going to generate so many basic blocks Humans are only going to co code so many different things before they put an if in there or some other thing that's going to cause a, co a, a control flow change. So I think that's definitely one possible mitigation. But yeah, it's, that's definitely a huge area of potential concern and one that I don't have a good answer for. Cool. Um, so I have a question as well. Um, kind of similar on the similar track. Um, so have you looked at function embeddings when you've, say, injected like a, a, a single line or something into the function and seen whether the function embeddings would also be similar there too? No, I haven't. That would be interesting to do. I'm just reminded of a news post from last week for silence and malware classification. Yeah. So. yeah, no, I, that, that would be interesting. I think these should largely be robust against that particular type of technique just because the code that you inject would have to in some, ha in some fashion over, over, overweigh the code that you are, that's already there. So I mean, if, you, if you look at the, uh, like say the worm safe model, you know, you, whatever line of code you're gonna put in, first off you have to know what vector is going to be generated by the instruction vectorizer, and then that, that vector would have to be of high enough magnitude to throw off everything else that it's already seen. So that's, I don't know how, I, I think that that's definitely interesting to do. But I think this would be fairly robust against that method for the function. All right, well then let's give another round of applause. All right, thanks.